The voice you are hearing yes. is that of Charles Castronovo. That's me. <laughs> Wait, hold on, let me put on the my radio time, voice. <laughs> the time has come. The time is now. Sweet. Episode one of the Sagawi podcast. Yes. <laughs> and I'm actually going to start it by stepping to the side here and getting Mr. Castronovo's coffee for him. Yes, you can do nothing without a coffee. Uh, that was my fee. Anything? I said coffee. No, no, no. Just straight up. All right. There you go, my friend. Thanks, bro. Yep. Yes. Excellent. Ich bin ein Berliner. Nice cup. <laughs> so, my man, you just came back. Yes. Just back to Berlin from... Where the hell was I? The oh, New York. Yeah, the New York. That's where I was, yeah. The big, big apple. Yeah, I had some shows there. And, uh, yeah, it was cold as hell. But uh, everything was fine. Everything stayed open. So I was happy about that. Man. Well, that's good. So, like, in the theater, there was no, like... Um Social distancing or anything like that, huh? No, actually. But I did notice, though, for a couple of the shows in the middle of the week that it seemed like the attendance was a bit down. I heard that people were a bit nervous, you know. Some people are nervous about going, but uh, there's, there were no restrictions. So, actually, it was, it was, you know, the first night was really well attended, and the last night was actually a matinee at one, and people love that. Mm. So, it was completely packed. So a couple shows in the middle of the week, though, you know, I saw some seats open, you know. Yeah. But, you know, yeah. it wasn't so bad. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. And it's awesome that you got a chance to do the this particular production of Bohem because it was the Zeffirelli production, yeah. which celebrated its 40th anniversary. Is yeah, that right? I think it's from the 80s, at some point in the 80s, if yeah. I remember correctly. Yeah. Yeah. So it, basically everyone's done it, you know. Yeah, so you think about all the great tenors who uh who wore that costume, yeah. sat in that sat in that chair and uh Yeah. and walked on that set. Yeah, you know? it was pretty awesome. Yeah, it's actually falling apart the set <laughs> the yeah, set I'm not quite surprised. a bit. <laughs> part I'm of not the surprised. part of the little chimney to the uh to the stove uh, fell off during a show and oh. like <laughs> we happened to catch it cuz we oh. were right by it. Yeah, okay. it was it was hilarious. <laughs> of course, you know, we were trying to act our best, but we forgot to act like it should be hot. Oh, right, 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 right. <laughs> but right. everyone just holding it like, oh, crap. And then we put it back up. And, you know, in the intermission, they like nailed it down. I don't know what they did. Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, you did the, you did the Carmen at uh, Deutsche Oper as well, didn't you? That's yeah, yeah. Like a, that's like an infamously old. Oh, you know, uh, I missed the old one, though. I, when oh, I did it, when I did one. it, it was oh, okay. the new production. Yeah. Okay. Oh, that's good. Yeah, that's the, the one with the, the, old the bull one balls. Is really old. Yeah, that's, yeah, the old one was super old, yeah. <clears throat> No, I did a new one where they, you know, cut off the bull's balls and, you know, present oh, them exciting. to Carmen. It was, yeah, it was great. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm going to step aside and get my coffee. Mm. So hang on a second. No worries. That's how you build up immun immunity to things. That's, that's really good for you, actually. That's why Generation X is doing well, you know. We're, <laughs> we're surviving, not complaining about stuff. <laughs> no, we're just talking about the... Uh, the the glasses that I just brought to the table for uh, for our water they've got like uh, some kalk stains on them. <laughs> uh, as far as I know, um, it, that's sort of okay for you. The, I mean, I think it's it's actually kind of healthy to drink. Oh yeah, probably. It's, it feels great on my skin. Like the <laughs> this is this is the you know the infamous Berlin water. It's terrible for like uh, dishwashers and uh, uh, yeah, right, right, washing machines because it builds up. So yeah. eventually. The hoses and stuff, they just close. Oh, uh, yeah, you're right. Kalk. Yeah. yeah. Actually, funny enough. It's like high cholesterol for, uh, <laughs> <laughs> for, for <a> dishwasher. dishwashers. <laughs> funny enough, I just got a new dishwasher this morning. Hey, yeah. congrats. So, I know no it was problem. on the fritz. It was on the fritz. It yeah. was on the fritz. It was, yeah, yeah. It's old. I think it was like, I don't know, 12 years old or something. I think that's about it. That's the lifespan of one of those guys. Oh, yeah, definitely. They're not made to last longer than yeah. that. And the new one has. Um, you can basically have an app so you can turn it on even nice. away from home <laughs> nice <laughs> exactly so cheers to yeah. our fir first yeah. podcast yeah. here uh, cheers buddy yeah uh, good job thanks mm. oh good 
I love these little Nespresso machines, right? Those are the best, yeah. Actually, when I bought one a few years ago, I just I almost wanted to take it around with me. You know, just so you yeah. can put it wherever you're staying, you know? Because they're small, and I mean, you know, you can get that, a pretty small one. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, um, you know, I did some concerts in Bavaria this year, and we drove down there, and uh, I just put it in a bag. Yeah. I was like, why should I drink crappy hotel coffee exactly. if I can, like, bring the Nespresso yeah. and just a handful of pods? And now... Now what's better too is um, you don't feel guilty about the pods because the pods used to be made of like plastic and oh yeah yeah and now and now they're made of like I don't know some kind of recycled soybeans or something and yeah I mean I think even the little cover that covers the coffee it's not it used to be like aluminum foil yeah, and yeah, now yeah. I think it's some kind of paper oh really that's crazy. yeah so it's completely it's like biodegradable you awesome. don't have to feel guilty about that but great yeah, yeah. It's not coffee like... technology <laughs> it's really come into its own can do nothing without coffee baby exactly no way so hmm. um i got my list i got a little list of uh topics here sweet that we can discuss um so uh I think lots of people would like to know, since now you've been singing professionally um, for at least 25 years. Yeah, just about, yeah. Just about 25 years. Um, how, did, how did it get started for you? Um, tell, me, uh, tell me where you grew up and uh, who your first sort of inspirations were. Yeah, well, I mean, I was born actually in Queens, New York, but I don't okay. remember it. You know, mm. my father came over from Sicily when he was about 16. Mm-hmm. And uh, my mother came from Ecuador, also about 16, 17 years old. This is when I'll cue the uh, parla piano in the yeah. background. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you need to have one of those keyboards you can play different sounds during your podcast. Yeah. That would be right. awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to interrupt no, yeah, no, no, it's okay. <laughs> Actually, that would be awesome. Put it in later, post-production. But uh, yeah, so he came over, and um, anyway, that my parents got married there, and uh, I would say we were there only until I was about two, so I don't really okay. remember it, and then uh, it was too damn cold for them. They both come from warm <laughs> countries, I guess. So, so we went to California and uh, to Los Angeles area, and uh, yeah, so that's, I remember my childhood is okay. all in LA, yeah, and, uh, and the surrounding areas. We kind of moved uh, further east into the suburbs as time went by, because mm-hmm. I guess it was just cheaper, you know? So. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, and then I grew up there, and, uh, you know, I would say probably by the time I was 13 or so, I always was in, um, I had an interest in, like, drama, I, like, joined drama when I was, you know, in, even in fifth, sixth grade, I was in plays, and then mm. in, in junior high, then I really started doing it, I would, like, join the drama class, one my electives, and, uh, you know, we did, um, we we did all kinds of stuff. I mean, I wasn't in choir at that time. That wasn't until high school. But, uh, you know, we did like impromptu, you know, acting. And you mm. know, we even did like our version of the gong show, you know, for like a play. And we just had to make up our own acts and everything. And I played like a wise guy who had an invisible dog doing tricks. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> and uh, my uh, my um, <laughs> drama teacher loved it. No one else got it. But I guess, you know, he, <laughs> he I don't know, he was from the East Coast, I guess. So he, he kind of got it because I was okay. doing this wise guy thing like hey yeah. how you doing you know <laughs> <laughs> uh, but anyway so um yeah so i like being on stage and we did some mm-hmm. real plays and everything too and then in high um i would say by the time yeah my freshman year of high school i just fell in love with led zeppelin and yeah, i love okay. classic rock yeah i always yeah. liked you know rock and you know well in the 80s we had great pop music i don't know about exactly. today but <laughs> exactly but uh, bring you know, back the yeah. sax solo <laughs> exactly but also people played their own instruments so you yeah know, for me like if you love music like you, you got to pick up an instrument you know right so um i mean of course there were some singers but basically everyone played and uh so i fell in love with led zeppelin and beatles and the beatles and all that stuff so i picked up uh i got a i think for 50 bucks i got a acoustic guitar and i taught myself how to play or or i would find someone who played a bit better than me and say hey teach me that chord you know I've, eventually i convinced my father to um to buy me like a poster that was a chord you know chord chart right so i learned a bunch of chords and then i just started playing and then i just started singing and i could kind of sing well 
you know mm-hmm. um actually what what en- what ended up happening was i think that was my sophomore year of high school i was playing during lunch with m- one of my buddies we were doing some beatles songs just singing and the choir teacher walked by and she was <laughs> she was funny uh erica raymond was her name and uh, she's shout uh, out to yeah, erica yeah, yeah erica yeah she's also erica, <laughs> Wherever you erica are. Dindler. yeah she was amazing <laughs> and uh she she walked by and she said oh you have such a nice voice you know why don't you join choir and i said no i'm gonna be a rock star you know i'm not gonna join choir <laughs> and she was a very clever clever woman and she said yeah but in choir you know we have like 50 girls and about six boys and I was like, ah. d- I did the math in my yeah. in my head real quick, like, doot, 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 doot. and I said, yeah, okay, I'll try it. You know, it's cool. I'll, you know, it sounds like, a- and you know, when I got there, it for me it was like singing the Beatles. You know, you sing harmony. You mm-hmm. know, and for me it was just interesting to sing harmony. I liked it. Right. Yeah. So then, um, but to be honest, you know, I started in uh, some rock bands where I was playing and singing, and uh, I I knew then that I. I could sing the notes, but I didn't have the grit in my voice. Mm. It was a bit mm-hmm. too clean, you know. It was like, if that sounds funny, it was too pretty, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. for what I wanted to do. You know, I could do some of the '80s ballads, you know, maybe a little bit better. But uh, anyway, but um, and then in choir, she said, "Here, you know, she gave me a solo in this, and she gave me a solo in that, and you know, then you get a reaction from people like, oh, that sounds so nice,' and and then you start to feel good. And then I was in the the musical we did, Oklahoma, was the first musical I did. And usually Curly is a, is a baritone role. Yeah. But, you know, the school band, you know, they're, they're, they weren't the greatest. So sometimes some of the things were transposed to the key of C and they oh. went up. Oh, so it became kind of like more like a tenor role. <laughs> interesting. So it kind of worked for me. It wasn't too low. And, Jimmy, you uh, have to play an F sharp. Yes, yeah, so, exactly. <laughs> Basically, well, there, put it in C. <laughs> there are three sharps in this key. No, yeah. So, uh, yeah. Holy so, crap! Exactly. I never heard of that. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Okay. So it was it was great. But then once I got on stage, so I was acting and singing. And uh, I freaking loved it, you know, because yeah. then you get a reaction and people were clapping. They were like, wow, I can't believe it. And and then I was kind of hooked, you know. But then I heard opera later that year. I, I heard opera for the first time. As soon as I heard it, I was like, oh, shit, that's what I want to do. Yeah. Because it was, it was kind of like the rock and roll of classical music. You know, it's dramatic. It's passionate. You know, it has all the, you know chaos of like a rock and roll thing but just you know where did you where did you hear it the first time do you remember well i mean you know you always hear some things even in cartoons sure when you're of kids. course yeah i mean yeah, yeah unfortunately uh unfortunately we get that like stereotype mm-hmm, you mm-hmm. know and i mean i think i would say 90 to 95 percent of them at least americans but you know it's a good portion of the entire world only know the stereotypes of yeah, opera for sure. one thing that kind of drives me crazy about mm-hmm. about uh about the the sort of ignorance of uh, of not knowing, yeah, you know, yeah, of, of, you know, <laughs> our profession, you know, when it, if people don't know anything, you know, and the first thing they say, oh, what do you do for a living? I'm an opera singer, yeah, you know, like you're a what? A, yeah, well, I'm sorry, what's that? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> oh, that's know? cool. Wait, yeah, Phantom of the Opera? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah, I love Phantom of the Opera. Yeah, mm-hmm. like, okay, yeah. great. <laughs> um, I uh, I used to always get too like when I was dating and I would just like do like a cold cold meeting to yeah. someone you know like introduce introduce yourself to a, at a bar you know right, right. and you're making small talk it's like you say you're an opera singer and you get one of two reactions you're like oh I, I actually can't relate to you you're probably like really fancy and rich <laughs> and you know you drive like a diamond encrusted exactly. Cadillac or something or you're you're a dirt poor artist. Yes, yeah, you know, exactly. Which is like, really what I was. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Total Labo M in real life. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> exactly. There's a reason why opera singers love Labo M so much. Exactly. So, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, yeah. So you heard stuff on TV. And... Yeah, you know, I heard some of that stuff mm-hmm. in general. But then um, I had a uh, well, I have a buddy, one of my best friends uh, since high school, and his father's also from Italy, from uh, from Bologna. And mm-hmm. unlike my family, who was wasn't into music, you know, I mean, they like music, but they no music, zero musicians in my family. Amazing. Yeah, and uh, his father actually freaking loves opera. Like he's a huge opera fan. Okay. So not a musician, but a huge opera fan. And uh, so I was at their house, and I said, "Yeah, I was singing, and I was singing, you know." And uh, he let me uh, borrow a CD of tenors because I knew I was a tenor already. I was in the tenor section, blah sure. blah blah, and it was just. Uh, t- 
different tenors singing different arias, you know, just a mix up. And I think if I remember correctly, the first thing I heard was the entrance of Otello with, oh my the, with the Domingo, you know, like the first time I really sat down and said, let me listen to some opera. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's uh, Exultate yeah, or something, right? Exultate, Largalio. And I heard that. I was like, holy shit. I said, this is epic. You know, it was like, That's unbelievable. you know, it was okay. like a superhero singing, you yeah. know, and I was like, oh, man. And then literally I was hooked. Like, literally, at that moment, I said, okay, this is what I will do. And then I just went crazy listening to this CD a million times and just trying to mimic, you know, trying to mimic the sound. And right. I could mimic this sound much more than I could Robert Plant. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Even though that's my other favorite tenor, Robert Plant. You yeah. know what I mean? You know, Can anybody you know? mimic Robert no, Plant? No, no. I mean, I think that's what makes him Robert Plant. Exactly. So. You know? So if I couldn't make his sound, then for some reason I could more closely mimic these other guys you yeah know? and it's interesting it that there. you liked uh led zeppelin because no. um you know they're sort of known in the rock community as being these amazing musicians mm -hmm. first of all and you know so many of their um so many of their songs uh have this sort of operatic nature to them where oh. they're you know extended in yeah. some way oh yeah there's these massive middle sections oh, where yeah. they you know like a whole lot of love where yeah. they you know they just start this middle section that's almost like hypnotic. You yeah, know? it's a giant jam in the middle. Yeah, yeah, and like suddenly, like you hear these bongo drums in the background. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> yeah. And Jimmy that's takes crazy. out a violin bow and starts playing yeah, his that guitar. Kind of stuff. With yeah, that yeah. kind of stuff. I think that was the first time I ever saw, uh, you know, the double guitar. Yeah, too. double like, neck why guitar. Why does he yeah. have two? two guitars yeah. like oh one has 12 strings or yes. what the heck so yeah, that's awesome. crazy yeah. that's oh yeah crazy. i mean don't get me going i mean it, we can also talk you uh, do a whole podcast about me you know talking about led zeppelin it's just like i'm just going crazy about them for yeah. me they're like gods yeah okay yeah yeah i love that stuff yeah but, i mean the beatles too i mean yeah. for all you know for all of the the, the, the scream queens that that loved the beatles you know yeah. that went to their concerts and basically just screamed yeah. i mean it's it's pretty much historical fact about how how great they were as musicians oh, so, i yeah, mean incredible. we saw like when they went off on solo careers you yeah. know it's like oh wow oh, like yeah. paul mccartney's no. can really hold his own so oh, can john yeah. lennon oh and yeah big time even uh, yeah, george harrison even george incredible. harrison did some great, great work yeah yeah when he left the beatles oh yeah i love that stuff man i go crazy about it. but yeah for me it was something like this like i wanted to do that but Obviously, I could feel that uh, the reaction was really when I started singing something classical. Then I'm sure. like, okay, I get this. And then I fell in love. Once I fell in love, that was it. You know, yeah, Then it was like I had blinders on and I yep. only saw that. So I, I went to college to study music, but I, I hated school. So mm -hmm. I stayed in school. I went to Cal State Fullerton. Uh, you know, in the LA area, and shout uh, out to yeah. Cal State Fullerton. <laughs> exactly, yeah, <laughs> exactly. But it was great because I, I, I admit my high school grades were just barely passable you know i graduated <laughs> mm -hmm. but they weren't amazing you know but because i did some auditions i i think i i auditioned cal state northridge and you know and uh well fullerton uh cal state la i don't remember there was like three or four but uh and they all offered me a bit of money to go to the music program mm -hmm. i mean you know it, they don't I mean, it wasn't that expensive back sure, then. Sure, exactly. You know? it, it, was, it was, they, you know, normal. They, they heard they the were, potential. Yeah. Somebody so, heard the potential. So. But I was, uh, I, I kind of uh, thought for sure I'm going to Fullerton because my teacher there was a tenor. You know, mm -hmm. if, if I would have studied there with him, it was, anyway, he was a tenor. So I felt that was, uh, for me, I already knew right away, I, a tenor voice is a bit strange anyway. Mm -hmm. So I better, uh, you know, study with someone who understands that. And then I stayed about a year uh, well, one year, full year, and I, I told him, I said, I, I'm not staying in school. It's just too slow for me. I want to get on stage, you know? Mm -hmm. And he said, well, school's not for everyone. He was very supportive. He said, school's not for everyone, but you're going to be missing out on some of the things you need to learn, so you're going to have to do it yourself. So he said, you're going to have to learn about the composers and, you know, the styles of, you know, the different uh, genres, uh, what's the difference between, you know, French style of opera and Italian and German, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, and languages and all that stuff. So I did it all on my own or, you know, soaking yeah. it up from somewhere else, you right. know, you know, but just not in class. 
So uh, of course I continued on with uh, voice lessons with him, you mm-hmm. know, but privately, okay. just privately, yeah. And you then, want to you mention know, that guy's name? Yeah, he's uh, Dr. Mark Goodrich, Shout and I love to him. Dr. Yeah, Mark. yeah, he's awesome, All and right. uh, he's still Cal State Fullerton. He's a great teacher, and actually, uh, whenever some young singers ask me. You know, in California and LA area, you know, mm-hmm. and I always send them to him because he gave me a great bass kind of um, technique, you know, because I, you know, we were working together for a while, but then my once my career started, I saw him less and less. Mm-hmm. But I always was able to keep myself in a pretty healthy place because of what he kind of the bass he gave me, you know. Mm-hmm. So, you know, after a certain amount of time, like, you know, if I thought, okay, this isn't working enough, every once in a while I would see him or talk to him. But in general, he gave me a good enough base that I could fix myself when I had to. You know, I was in a safe area. Right. And then little by little, you know, I was discovering stuff on my own, you know, in a couple, you know, my manager or a coach where I would trust their ear a bit and say, oh, it sounds like you need a little bit of this or less of that. Uh, But other than that, uh, I didn't work with anyone until maybe about eight years ago. Then I finally got a new teacher, Arthur Levy, who's in uh, New York. Shout out to Arthur. You know him very well. He just happens to be my teacher, too. Exactly, (laughs) yeah. He's the man. Exactly. I love him. And, uh, you know, that's when I knew that I needed something. I wanted, basically, I, I felt like, you know, my body was telling me, okay, you need to add this and you need to do this. And it was going somewhere. But it was really nice to have someone, you know, kind of confirm that. Okay, you have the right instinct. Definitely. Let's explore this and let's go more. And it was more about using my whole body when I sing and, you know, kind of accessing the whole depth of the voice, you Mm -hmm. know, letting... But I did it slow. I always moved slow. So... in a way, it was uh, it was useful for me because you know my voice matured uh, not too fast, I guess. Even though it was sometimes frustrating, because some of the people I started with sometimes would go have success faster than me, or let's just say they did things earlier than you know than I did, and yeah. I wanted to do that too. But in the end, it served me well just to kind of go at a slower pace. Such and, a trap with this career. Yeah, it's you know a, you yeah, see you see it all the time. Yeah, you see yeah. people. Um, yeah, singing here, singing there, yeah. and you're like, well, why am why am I not singing exactly. here? Exactly. Well, did they not think about me? Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's kind of crazy, but uh, yeah. And well, anyway, to to finish the the basic history story, mm-hmm. after after I left school, I auditioned. Um, uh, I was in a, a chorus for one season in Opera Pacific, which was uh, it doesn't exist yeah. anymore. Yeah, but they uh, were like the Orange second. County yeah, in Orange County. Right? Yeah. yeah, and it was a it was a good opera company. Mm-hmm. They did, you know, really nice shows. Um, they were they sort of kn- they were theater. sort of known as the. Sorry to interrupt. They were sort oh. of known as the uh, the New York City opera style. Yes, opera it, exactly of of, uh, of the West Coast, where yeah. they would sort of try out some new things, mm-hmm. some early music every once in a while, mm-hmm. you know, stuff like that, right? Yeah, yeah, they some did. American they did that. Premieres, yeah, they did, and we did uh, some some random things there. I remember we did, I think. Regina, which is oh, the, yeah. yeah, you know, so but we Mark, also uh, Mark Blitzstein, yeah, yeah, but mm-hmm. we've all, we also did Carmen and a couple, you know. So I was in yeah. I was in a chorus there, just getting some experience, you know, and uh, and then right after that was done, I auditioned an L.A. opera, and they put me in just two shows in the chorus, which was Pagliacci and Norma. Oh my god! Yeah, which was cool. Went because like, and how old were you then? So I was. Uh, that was in. I'll tell you right now. That was in 1996. So I guess I was about 21, 22, 22 wow. years old. Yeah, and then right when I was there and in that so, chorus. Uh, so yeah, uh, no. L.A. Opera is, um, I mean, especially since Domingo has been associated there, yeah. is, you know, arguably one of the maybe top five. Yeah, for top, sure. Top 10 for companies sure. in the U.S. For sure, yeah. Um, and so, and of course, Pagliacci yeah. is iconic opera yeah. with an iconic tenor role uh it's hard not to be inspired by that i mean yeah. norma is also a great tenor yeah. role but yeah. i mean obviously that's driven by the by more the soprano role sure, the sure, role yeah. of norma um but i can't imagine i mean i i think i would have just been and i'm sure you were basically just floating yeah i was because I was... just to, just to stand behind uh, do you remember who were who was in those casts yeah the in pagliacci was placido domingo <laughs> Oh, shit. <laughs> and the uh, baritone was Juan Pons. And, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Juan I mean, Pons. It was, inc- okay. it was incredible. Yeah, but Placido was singing. Okay. And actually, they put me as a cover for this little 
uh, contadino part, you know, where he says, uh, you know, uh, bada pagliaccio, ta 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 ta. It's like, you know, like yeah, three yeah, measures. Yeah, yeah. And I had to do it in a couple rehearsals. Oh with my. So I was like, Gosh. I didn't do it on stage that time. But uh. did you ever did you ever tell Domingo that like, hey, do you remember this? No, Tom? no, <laughs> no, I, no. But I remember, um, I remember very specifically. I don't, I don't think it's just a dream in my head, but the way they staged the Norma, you know, like, uh, you know, you got all these. Celts, you know, these uh, druids in the chorus. And so I was, we were all bald. We had bald caps. Oh, geez. So I was right in front of the way they staged me. I was right in front and we're singing this kind of hardcore uh, chorus, you know. And he was con- and he was conducting the Norma. So he sang Pagliacci oh, my and he conducted Norma. Gosh. <laughs> so uh, it was Jose Cura was singing the Polione. Okay. That time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But uh, anyway, so I remember I was just singing my balls off, you know, like I'm just gonna, I was so excited. And I can see him. He looked up at me like, and he was looking at me like, "Uh huh, someone's really singing their ass off there," you know. And I was like, "And I still remember that exact moment." But Holy what happened crap. right after that? Then they started offering me small roles, and then I did like Remendado, and uh, the the first role I ever sang on stage professionally was um, uh, called Baron Rouvel, Rouvel, which was uh, it's in Fedora, okay. which was with Placido. So yeah, singing. yeah, yeah. Holy so cow. so I so I had to sing a couple lines with him, and so that was my debut. When I was twenty three, yeah. And then I did like Ruiz in in Trovatore, and you know things like that. Okay. You know things like that. So I did Man. a bunch of small roles. I ended up doing about a hundred performances. That my two years I was in L.A. almost a hundred performances. Just that you know is all kinds of small. So I got a lot. I got a lot of experience, which was much better than you know being in school. You know? Oh my God! Yeah, <laughs> it is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you know when we in, the moments where we are in our careers right now. You know we're 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 about the same age. Yeah. I think I'm like four years older than you, um, but. Uh, we're still like we're like in the meat of our of our career you know and so there's so much emphasis on maintaining and trying to improve the voice yeah um finding jobs especially during covid oh yeah that was hell (laughs) um you know and making sure that those jobs are at least uh a quality where it's going to it's going to advance our career yeah you know or at least not devance it. No, that's not a word. <laughs> Decrease it yes, somehow. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, but to rem- to go back to go back in time and remember those moments. I mean, that's almost like a movie script. Oh. You know, to get to 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 fortunately grow up in an area where there was L.A. opera. Yeah, and. Um, and then uh, you know, get get into the chorus, have that tiny role, you know, and then it, it's just the it's just a moment where you're you're working at L.A. and when Placido is there, yeah. you know, who is you know arguably the most influential opera figure uh, of the last fifty years. Yeah. Yeah, definitely, years. definitely one of the top ones for that for sure. He's a you know legend, basically. Hey, I forgot to tell you one detail: the Pagliacci was directed by Zeffirelli, and he was there. Okay. <laughs> oh my gosh. So he was. Yeah, it was kind of a crazy introduction just to being on the you know stage. Yeah, and <laughs> I mean, did you? So you were like 23, 22, 23 at yeah. this time. I mean, yeah. did you? Did you have any kind of um, uh, like? Did the situation, I mean, I'm sure you were like just excited as crazy, like crazy, because I mean, to hear, I I can't even imagine what it's like to stand on stage with Domingo singing right next to you. And like, I mean, I I know what it's like. I mean, when you sing in your, in your living room and we do these little concerts, I mean, it's just like, I can't stop the the chills. (laughs) I mean, it's just like, um, you know, uh, uh, Kat as well, your wife, uh, when she sings too, I mean, you know, um, it's just the chills, you know, yeah. and, and I see it when I sing for other people too. Yeah, yeah. You know, I don't get the chills when I sing for myself, <laughs> but when I sing for other people, you know, I, I, I you know, if I can see them, I'm, yeah. I often see them as like, Oh, look at my arm. Yeah. You yeah. Know? <laughs> yeah it's so yeah, vis- it's visceral when you're right yeah, next to someone. It's totally in the room, visceral. Yeah. And it's, yeah. it's something that, um, I, you know, I always would, would think that 
people would be people would love uh, would be really into opera more if they had the opportunity to oh, experience yeah. that you know yeah. sing have a have a singer like in the room but i mean did you grasp the impact of that moment or were you just kind of like this is cool this is fun yeah. wow i mean i feel something with opera yeah. no like, i uh, no i totally knew what was going on you because knew. because you know by that point i was already like okay this is my destiny this is what i must do you know and i okay. had some crazy dreams i even like i'll tell you after too like i, I had a <laughs> I, I made a big long list of all the roles that i wanted to sing in my career and i had an idea of where you know what year i would sing them like how old Holy i would crap. be That's and great. you know i had all these books of tenors you know biographies of tenors and uh, always in the back of these of these books, they, they would always have when they first sang a role, what year, right. where it was. And then I would figure out how old they were. And then I would compare. I said, okay, well, you know, I love Carreras, but he was a bit early with things. So I can't really fall in that. Um, you know, uh, Krauss actually waited quite long to do things. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's a little bit too careful. I can do it early. And like, I would try to like balance, like, where do I fit in? You know? Mm. <laughs> and I would, so I had this crazy list. And when I was there, when this was happening, oh, I was, uh, I was like, this is exactly where I wanted to be. You know, I didn't, that's exactly why I left school because I was trying to get real experience mm -hmm. because watching those guys on stage, you know, you're there. And when you're singing a small role, um, you know, it's, a, it's not as much pressure. Of course, there's pressure. You're on stage. You have to be professional, but you know, you're not the main role. So you can experiment a bit. So when, for example, we did Carmen, Placido singing again, Don Jose. Oh my gosh. So it was an, a, to see him, you know, singing that stuff sure. like in act three, you know, and I was yeah. watching him. What he's, what is he doing? How is he standing? I can see what's happening with his diaphragm. He's, you know, pushing and, and all the things that he's doing. And if, you know, at the end, you know, la liberté. So mm. it's a high C. And so I did not have high C, but I, I was trying it though, because I was getting buried out by the whole damn chorus and everyone anyway, so it doesn't matter. Right. So I was just taking some risk and making some experiments with myself yeah, on stage, you, have you to know. Do that. And of course, just literally being on stage, you know, you just figure out how to do that, you mm -hmm. know. So for me, I just knew I was like, this is exactly where I wanted to be. I was really in awe of everything, but I was just trying to work my ass off, you know. And uh, yeah, I spent two years there. Yeah, uh, just doing a whole, whole bunch of small roles, and I got a lot of experience there. You know, that's what really got me on the right path. What happened right after was that I, um, I while I was still in LA, I auditioned for Jonathan Friend, who was casting director at uh, Metropolitan Opera, and mm -hmm. I was doing. He came when we were do. Uh, he came to listen to someone. I think it was Stephanie Blythe do her first Madame Quickly in Falstaff. Okay, and I was singing Bardolfo. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god yeah yeah which that's was a hilarious. hard it's actually role. hard it's actually really hard <laughs> that's a hard yeah. that, that's it was what so we call that's what we call in the in the opera world a rat boy role yeah yeah it is. because <laughs> especially bardolfo i yeah. mean basically he just he's got to sing this insanely hard music yeah, yeah. i mean hard in the sense that it's very rhythmic yeah there's totally. a lot of words yeah. a lot of italian yeah um it's you know, it's it's a little bit comical, yes, and yeah. uh, basically, you got to do this all the while. Falstaff is kind of kicking the shit out of you all over the stage, exactly you know, like because it. he's sort of <laughs> he's sort of uh, he's sort of he's sort of like a page oh, to, yeah. Uh, yeah, to, exactly. to Falstaff, you know. Oh, so and uh, oh man, it's crazy. I, okay, so I, I always called him Barf Dolfo be oh. because at the beginning of this production, I think it was Stephen Lawless is. Uh, He's his production, and at the beginning, when the curtain opened, um, I'm throwing up in a bucket oh, because he's nice. a drunk, you know. Bar Bardolfo's yeah. always drunk, so yeah, yeah and I yeah. had this big prosthetic yeah. red nose, oh, it was shit. awesome, it was That's hilarious. Awesome, I, I'm sure somewhere I have some pictures, it was it was great, okay. Anyway, but uh, yeah, so anyway, uh, Jonathan Friend came to one of the shows, and then while he was there, I did an audition for him on stage in LA. And then, he, literally, they offered me the role of Beppe in Pagliacci, which great. is a great. You know, secondary a role, but you great get an one. Aria. You have a great aria, a very famous one. Yeah, you know? and everybody remembers it. Oh yeah, it's so beautiful. Because the action kind of stops. Yeah, and the uh, they actually offered it to me. So at the Met. At the Met. So I, it wow. was like my first uh, solo contract because when I was in LA, I was considered a resident artist. They didn't have young artists at the time. Right. They were called resident artists, where we just okay. did all the small roles, and um, so it was my first uh, real 
contract for a role. So, of course, I said yes. And it was the opening night of the Met. Of course, guess who was singing? Placido Domingo singing Pagliacci. Okay. Yeah. So, same uh, cast. Yeah, it was so almost Juan the same Pons cast. It was and, also uh, Juan Pons. Yeah. It was. Was, uh, was it um, Teresa Stratus? Uh, no, it was uh, Veronica uh, Viorael. Uh, she's Chilean soprano. was okay. wonderful. Yeah. Okay. Because I think they made a DVD and it was yes. Juan Pons Domingo and yeah. Teresa Stratus. That's and I just exactly remember right. Stratus in that. Yeah. I mean, the other two, of course, were phenomenal, but yeah. I was so compelled by Teresa Stratus because uh, because her acting was yeah. just intense, so intense. Yeah, yeah, she is uh, so amazing. intense. She's yeah. such a, a uh, an amazing singing actress. Oh yeah, and, I uh, loved her. Yeah, yes, yeah, so that was Zeffirelli production, yeah. also too mm-hmm. film. Yeah. So anyway, so uh, I said yes, of course, and um, and then maybe like three months later. Um, they asked if I would come and audition for the rest of the people at the Met. And when I did that, then they offered me the Young Artist Program at the Met. And mm-hmm. I have to say, in all honesty, I was about um, two inches away from saying no. Because I thought, well, I just got done doing two years of small roles. Mm-hmm. And I don't think I want to do that anymore. But after I had a good think, I... Th- I you I, already I, did a role on the main stage of the Met. Well, no, but I mean, it, it didn't happen yet. Oh, I see. So I, I, they offered me the contract, okay. and I signed it, and I'm doing that. But then they said, can you come and sing for the rest of the people? Because only Jonathan Friend heard me. Right. When I did that, they said, we'd like to offer you a young artist program also. Okay. And I almost said no, but then in the end, I just really thought about it, and I said, you know, maybe I need a bit more time to stew. You mm. know, maybe it's a just a hair too early. Mm-hmm. When I started the program and when I did that first role of Beppe there, my debut there, it was uh, September of 99. So okay. I was ex- uh, exactly um, turning 25. Okay. Uh, yeah. So anyway, I made my debut. It went really great. And then I spent two years in the program. It should be a three-year program. But to right. be honest with you, by by the end of the first year, I said, there's no way I'm staying three years. Yeah. Because actually, Beppe was the best role I did there. I did other small roles, but, you know, in a way, they were less because Beppe is a, a very good, you know, right. secondary role. Right. So, you know, I did things like the first prisoner in Fidelio, um, you know, blah, 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 some things yeah. like that. So, which were all great, but at the same time, you know. Anyway, yeah. so I left after two years. They were very mad because they wanted me to stay a third year. But mm. uh, I said I need to get going. But while I was there, they were there was good and bad things, of course, like every like everything. Mm-hmm. Um, but while I was uh, each year I was in the program, they released me two times to do real gigs. So I did my first um, Don Ottavio in Boston Lyric Opera. Mm-hmm. I did my first Fenton in Pittsburgh. I did my first Nimarino in um, Portland. And also first um, uh, Cosi Fan Tutte, also in Portland. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. So Oh, and also Don Pasquale. So, like, I, I got... Uh, once I did that, I thought, well, there's no t- way I'm staying a third year. Yeah. I said, I need to get my ass out there and really do it now. Right. That's the only are, way to learn your craft. Yeah, you know? those are respectable regional yeah. houses. Yeah, so. they were good houses, yeah. you know. I mean, you know, it was great. So, I left. Uh, they were mad about it, but I didn't care anymore. And then I almost immediately, you know, started doing more work and... And then I started coming to Europe, and and then from that point on, actually, I started singing more in Europe, you know, even more than America. I mean, I had uh, some gigs in America, mm-hmm. but more and more I was singing in America, uh, in uh, Europe. Yeah, know? there's just so many more yeah. opera houses. Totally. I yeah. mean, the totally. reason I I sort of came to Germany was because here you have a country about the size of Montana, yeah. and there's 80 opera houses. <laughs> exactly. And it's like, you want another coffee, man, no, or no, you, no, you go good. with water? I'm good. Okay. Yeah. Um, that's uh, still water, so. Perfect. Good. Um, yeah, it's fresh. Yes. Crack yes. the seal. <laughs> uh, yeah, and I mean, you know, in all of uh, North America, I think there's not even uh, 50. Yeah, there's no. I mean, Thanks, every, ta- every town here in uh, Germany, you know, has at least one opera house, it seems. Yep. Berlin has uh, three. Berlin has three yeah. A houses. Yeah, it's crazy. And every time, you know, every time I talk to someone who's sort of sort of on the outside, maybe like sort of from an econ- economic standpoint, they're like, how can a city with barely four million people support three A houses? Basically, three houses with... 
I mean, we won't say the size that doesn't compare to the Metropolitan. Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, because the Metropolitan is what three thousand eight hundred. Oh, I think it's, I think it's C- about four thousand with 4, all the standing with all the standing oh, with room. All the standing I think room, so. Yeah. Four thousand. Yeah. yeah. The, there's no house that big. Yeah. Um, but as far as the schedules and the amount of repertoire, um, it's bigger than the Met. You know, they do more performances. Oh, it's huge. It's amount. just, huge I, I just don't, I don't understand how they can do, I mean, I, it's one of the reasons I'm here uh, and it's great, but it's, it's still hard for me to fathom how they can do Carmen at Deutsche Oper. They can do Turandot at uh, the Staatsoper. And at the Komische Oper, they can do like the nose, right. you know, all on the same night. Yeah. And have all three be sold out. Yeah. It's crazy. I it's, know. They do it all the time. It's unbelievable. They do it all yeah. the time. Yeah. Whether, and it's it's interesting, you almost have like two kinds of opera goers. You have the people that go to see the productions, mm. and you have the people that go to see the singers, yeah. you know? Right. So they'll they'll stand in line to get tickets to go see you know Alanya yeah, yeah. if he's going to sing somewhere right. and they'll also stand in line to go see Barry Kosky's The Nose right. at uh, at Komische Oper mm-hmm. um, it's just an amazing atmosphere you know and still most of the people that I meet like whether they're my hockey buddies or whether I meet them through friends of friends or uh you know, uh, other uh, parents uh, of, you know, the kids, they still say, oh, you're an opera singer? Yeah. Hmm. I think I was to the opera when I was five years old, yeah, yeah. but uh, I don't really know another opera singer, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, so it's still, you still meet people. You don't, you, I, I never met somebody who says, oh, yes, I have a subscription to the commercial opera, yeah. you know? <laughs> I, I've seen every production this year, you know? Yeah, every once in a while you meet someone, you know, who's definitely been, but yeah, it's st- it's not every time, for sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But it's still yeah. it's still amazing, yeah, you yeah. know? It's, it's so- definitely not like, like the U.S. where you meet someone and they're like, uh, you, you're an opera singer? No, no, no. <laughs> like, what do you do really? <laughs> What's your real job? <laughs> I love that question. Uh, <laughs> never mind. I'm in sound production. We'll yeah, exactly. just go with that. Sound production. There you go. <laughs> I am producing sounds. Yes, that's true. Yeah. Um, let me let me ask you a question because um, I think it probably happened somewhere about this time. Um, when and how did you get your first agent? Yeah. So what happened was while I was uh, in L.A. as a resident artist, um, I was you know singing with a lot of interesting singers. And um, one of the singers uh, said, "Hey, my manager's coming. You're you're really talented. You should sing for her." Uh, actually, and I didn't really do an audition for her. She just heard me in the production. And then I think what happened was um, she just said, "Listen, you know, uh, I can represent you." And of course, I thought that was pure luck because it was a good agent. Uh, uh, at ICM at the time, which doesn't exist anymore, but uh, yeah, okay. it was ICM. Yeah, ICM. Yeah, that was it. I think so. Oh God, I don't know. They had so many names. Uh, it's like you know, Cami, oh, uh, ICM, uh, ICM, uh, and IMG. IMG. Yeah, yeah, no, it was ICM. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, <laughs> so yeah, and then that was great. Um, and she found some concerts for me and things mm-hmm. like that, which we started almost right away. But then I was in the Young Artist Program, and uh, yeah, she helped. Uh, like I think. She was the one who got me that first gig of uh, uh, Don Ottavio in Boston. That was mm-hmm. my first leading role, okay. which was in 2000. So, of course, I was singing professional roles, but smaller roles before that. But I kind of consider like the real start of my serious career was in 2000, when okay. I started singing lead roles, you know, getting paid in a real opera house, you know? Right. <laughs> you know right. what I mean? Okay, 99, I sang Beppe and Pagliacci. But you know what I'm saying? You know? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, How unprecedented is that? Like, you get a contract to sing at the Met, <laughs> and then they're like, um, can you actually, like, come back to school for us? Yeah, exactly. Like, go into our Young Artist Program? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's totally unprecedented, you know? But, you know... I think you made the right decision yeah. because when you do these 
young artist programs that, especially ones that are affiliated with really big opera houses. I mean, the Met is the Met Young Artist yeah. Program is arguably the biggest one. For sure. But you know, um, the Staatsoper in Berlin yeah. has a very, very good one. Um, you get very connected by doing that, and they take care of their own as yeah, well. Yeah. So you do Seems the opera so. studio there, yeah. and then, and then they 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 use you on stage yeah. uh, for for quite a few years after that. Uh, I think the Wiener stops over the Vienna State House. They also have, yeah. Also has also one, Royal right? Opera Covent Garden. They Royal have a Opera. great program. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Um, and uh, yeah, you make connections that are otherwise just not available to you. Yeah, that's true. That's true. You yeah. know, yeah. I mean, um, uh, I think the first time we met. Um, you were in the Young Artist Program, and I was dating someone in the Young Artist Program. Oh, right, right. That, that, was, that was in with me, right? Yeah. 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 And Small world. I went to see a concert that you got that the Young Artists put on, and it was uh, just with singer and piano. Oh, okay. But, and I, I think it was mostly leader. Mostly people were singing leader. Oh, was it in Carnegie Hall? Uh, or was it somewhere it, else? No, it was a very small venue. Like huh. it was sort of like a parlor. Huh. Can't remember what it was. Okay. But the thing that kind of shocked me the most, what because I didn't, I think I didn't realize when I went to the concert what was happening. But James Levine was playing the piano oh, that for was, everyone. I think that was that was a small hall in Carnegie Hall. Yeah, that's probably right. Yeah, that was crazy. And I, I remember like, that. I'll tell, I've got a great story about that. Okay. By the way. Yeah, yeah. So, but I was basically like. This is amazing. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm a little bit envious, but more, more I'm in, I'm in awe that these singers can make this connection at this stage in their life with, you know, w you know, with someone like James Levine, who, yeah. who was um, pretty much an opera god, yeah. Yeah, for especially sure. at that moment. Oh, yeah. Big time. Big time. You know, so tell me about that. Yeah, that I, I, I don't remember what you sang. Yeah, it may have uh, been like Una Fortiva or something. No, no, no. We, no, no? we literally did all Schubert. Oh, right. Yeah. Now I remember. Yes, we did it was all, an all Schubert concert. It was an yeah. all Schubert concert okay. in the smaller hall of, of, Carnegie, of hall. Carnegie Hall. Yeah. And uh, it was funny because, uh, yeah, I remember this so clearly because it was an incredible experience. But, uh, you know, Levine, we would usually see Levine about once a week. And we would work on different things. A lot of times, you know, we would do opera arias or duets or whatever. And then we, we always had a concert each year, you know, on stage with the Met Orchestra of mm. the young artists. And we would do arias and duets, blah, 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 quartets, whatever. And then at the beginning of this year, that was I think that was my second year of the program. And he said, you know what, guys, um, let's work on some Schubert. And, you know, I mean, I freaking love Schubert, so it's not a problem. Yeah. But at the same time, everyone's like, aren't we supposed to be learning opera? You know, the, you know, like they want to work on roles and arias and stuff. But actually, once we started getting into it, it was incredible because he was a phenomenal uh, accompanist. You know, sure, I mean, it's of course. Incredible. Yeah. Uh, I mean, pian pianist in, in general. But uh, the way he was playing Schubert and all that stuff was something. Anyway, so what happened was we spent like a like like I said, once a week, I think maybe uh, we met about six or seven times before the concert, right? So he assigned everyone two or three songs, but he didn't play. So we would uh, go um, into the rehearsal room, and all of us would be there, everyone was called, and then he would work with whoever, but the young artist pian pianists were playing uh, the songs. And towards uh, when we got closer to the concert, he said, I'm going to play some of the songs, at least one for everyone. But he says, I don't know yet which one. So I'll, I'll let you know. So he oh. didn't say, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so he never sat down on the piano playing with us. So he would always just coach us on the songs, you know, and, okay. the, and the accompanist. So anyway, he gave me Nacht und Träume, which is uh, incredible. Oh, beautiful in, I mean, song. Such a song. Yeah. You know? And another song, um, I forgot what it's called now. <laughs> I mean, it, it's been a while. Uh, yeah. Yeah, but anyway, there's there was another beautiful one. And, and then, yeah, I had three songs in general. But, but I remember Nacht und Träume. Anyway, oh, was, the other one was called Nacht Traum. And it's uh, about an uh, old man playing a harp and then he dies. You know, Schubert. Oh, wow. Schubert. It was pretty yeah, awesome. Yeah, yeah. I don't think I know that one. And then okay. I did the... Der, der Schiffer, 
is was a fast one. But you know, Schubert. It was great. Great. Anyway, so we're doing all the coachings every week, blah blah blah. Then it's coming to the concert. And then literally the day of the concert, he tells us what he's gonna play. So he ends up playing two of my songs, which is Nacht und Träume and this um, Nacht, uh, Nacht, Stück. Nacht Stück. That's what it's okay. called. Nacht Stück. Anyway, so, and then the um, young artist played the other one, the, the Schiffer one. Anyway, so my first one was the Nacht und Träume. So every, it was like, you know, they made a program and everyone, we were all sitting on stage while everyone else sang. So we never hmm. got to go off stage. So anyway, so here we are. I've never sung at Carnegie Hall before. And, and we go, he never played for us, either. never until the concert. So I, I never heard him play. That's amazing. Yeah. So anyway, so we get, I get there and my first song is Nacht und Träume. And if you know the song, it it starts, well, very soft, you know, mm. bloom, 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 you know. And anyway, so I stand there and he looks at me, I look at him and start. And then he starts playing, and it's the most full, soft, yet like huge sound in a way, yeah. even though it's so super crazy pianissimo. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know how he did it. I don't know how he did it. His touch was somehow so soft on the keys, that, but it was so full. It was literally incredible. As soon as he started playing, the whole it's it felt like the air got sucked out of the room. Oh yeah. And it went I, into like death silence mode, you know God. what I mean? And so he starts playing and I I I listened first because there's an intro, you know, and I thought, that is the most beautiful thing I ever heard. And then my next thought is, how the hell am I gonna come in? Mm. Because you know the, the first line is you know and mm -hmm. it should be pianissimo you yeah. know on it's a just a d natural it's not that mm -hmm. it's high but mm -hmm. it's sensitive you know yeah so in my mind going at 100 miles an hour is like oh i'm gonna go ah, or i'm gonna go ah, and ruin the mood you know do it really too strong or if i try it too soft you know something and in my mind, I'm going, I'm going to screw this up so bad, you know? I'm only laughing because I've been there so yeah, many exactly, times. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, yeah. So somehow, somehow, I took a breath and I just went, oh, and came in perfectly, oh. perfectly, right? Soft, perfectly, and I'm going to do Zinka's knees, blah, 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 blah. Anyway, we do the whole song, and then we get towards the end, you know. And da, da, di, da, di, da, stille, stille, no. Blum, 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 blum. And I swear to God, no exaggeration. The audience is quiet for like 10 seconds. Of complete silence, yeah. Because he's because he holds it. Yeah, he, he holds, holds it. The chord, he doesn't, and he doesn't move. And he didn't move, and it just he let the piano just die like for ten seconds. Yeah. Until there was just complete silence. Everyone was like, and I said I was like frozen, and then, and they you know yeah. then there was the big applause. Yeah. And I never felt something like I thought that was fucking incredible really yeah. you know and i i looked at him and he looked at me and he just nodded like yeah mm. like he just gave me that <laughs> nod like yeah that's it like that and i was just like holy shit and i sat down i sat down i never had a I never had an experience like that that was crazy crazy that i was never crazy. heard it yeah it was, uh, it was crazy. i'm so glad i was there for that i mean i don't I'm, of course i don't remember the detail like oh, that i mean man. i remember yeah thinking to myself James Levine is playing the piano like right in front of me yeah. I'm experiencing this in this sort of like it, it, I mean that room it's almost like a parlor mm -hmm. right it's a very small. small it's pretty small I think it seats 80 people yeah or maybe I don't know yeah. 100 maybe yeah. maximum yeah, yeah it's, it's small very very small good acoustic and yeah. so you, you know the intimacy that you yeah. have I mean yeah I mean you can pick up all that all the subtleness that he puts in the piano oh, yeah. and uh and of course with the singers as well you wow. can hear all that yeah so. you hear every detail that was crazy yeah. just literally i have no <laughs> words for that except it was just like insane you know and uh, i'll never forget that yeah it was all it was uh, amazing okay. that is amazing i mean <laughs> God, you pile you pile together experiences like that yeah. in your life and mm. 
and uh, makes you incredibly thankful yeah, for I, what for what. Uh, yeah, I, I got lucky during my time there. Like a lot of interesting things happened. My other huge story, like I have those two stories. One about James Levine and what happened then, and mm. then the other one was you know when Pavarotti came to sing Tosca at the Met. But that was the best for me, the best part of the program because, yeah, you know, master classes, you know, they're hit or miss. You know, mm-hmm. like we, I remember we had master classes with really some. Some legends. I mean, Birgit Nielsen. I mean, I Jesus. had a master class with Birgit Nielsen. I have a great photo of her and I, you know, doing the master class. It was yeah. public. You know, there were some people there uh, watching the audience. And uh, I mean, it was incredible. Of course, yeah. she, like, a, I mean, legend of legends, you know. But what did she say? First off, I thought, what the hell am I going to sing for Birgit Nielsen? They chose me to be one of the ones who sang at the public one. I thought, what the hell am I going to sing? So I said, okay, I'm going to sing um, Tamino, the Tamino aria, because, sure. okay, it's German. She did a lot of that repertoire, but none of the stuff that I was working on was really her stuff, you know? Right. Anyway, so I sang it, and, and she... And she um, you know, she said, you know, support, you know, bride, bring it to you. Mm. know, I mean, the basic things that, you know, almost anyone can say, right. especially in a public setting, you know, they say certain things. I, I was, of course, very thankful and very in awe of her and being there. But, you know, there wasn't any hardcore work happening there. Right. You know what I mean? But for me, the best experience of the program was uh, that I saw so many performances. But a lot of times I wouldn't go to the audience every time. I would just go to the side of the stage and just kind of kneel down right. You know, if I took maybe another step or two out, I would be on stage. So I'm just off where, you know, no one can see me. So I can see the singers really close. And when Pavarotti came to sing Tosca, I was literally like, four feet away from him when he was Jeez. singing e luceva le stelle, you know with this yeah. and I mean many things but you know that aria in particular where he's downstage left and that's right where I was like this so I was four feet away from him yeah. when he's singing this you know and I was like I mean you can't you cannot get that in no. any school no. you know that was and also I had a lot of colleagues I went to the rehearsal when he was in rehearsal and I told the stage manager I said please can I just sit in the corner here they said yeah just sit there don't sit there. And none of my other colleagues did that and I'm like what are you doing it's Pavarotti I will yeah. literally like I stick my ear like in the yeah. in the door if I had to yeah I would you know have done I mean? that too you know but no one seemed to do it but I guess maybe that's why they let me they said okay Strange. sit in the corner right there and yeah. I just sat there you know listening and watching him you know and uh, it was crazy so in the rehearsal uh, when I was sitting watching him someone introduced me to him and said oh Luciano this is Charlie he's a young artist tenor blah 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 blah. he said oh nice to meet you do you want to sing for me that was his first line he said to me what he said nice to meet you do you want to sing for me and I said uh, 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 yes yes please and three days later I was in his apartment on Central Park um, holy South holy crap yeah I was in his apartment Central Park South I forget what the name of the building was it's a famous one there and I went with the pianist and I stayed in his living room for like I don't know, 45 minutes singing, and he was working with me. Yeah. It was crazy. I mean, oh it was literally gosh. insane. He was nice. When I walked into the <laughs> when I walked into the apartment, um, his wife opened the door and said, oh, he's in the living room. Go ahead. And I walked into the living room. He was sitting on the sofa with his feet up on the on the, the coffee table yeah. with his famous scarf around, yeah. you know, light scarf, and he was eating a bowl of ice cream. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, it was. That is awesome. I never will forget it. And he was like, oh, bien, Giovinotto, come, come, come. What do you? And he said, and he starts talking to me, what are you going to sing? And I sang the Traviata aria. And then, you know, he had me sing a bit of this and a bit of that. And we talked about the passaggio. And and uh, he was very nice. But at the end, he said, you know, hey, you know, you're, you're wonderful. I, I love what you're doing. If you ever need any help, just let me know. But then I, I was like, uh, I'm like, what should I say? Ask him for his phone number? I, I, I was like, oh, thank you, Maestro. Thank you so much. But, you know, I, I mean, I didn't ask him for help after. Maybe I should have been more brave. But I was so in awe and respectful you know, I, you know what I'm saying? I just yeah. said, oh, thank you so much. And it was literally crazy. You know? <laughs> that, that is unbelievable. That is unbelievable. Yeah, I mean, crazy. yeah. I mean, I guess Pav went through this period in his life. Um, I guess it was sort of the second half of his career where, remember, he had this uh, uh, competition. Yeah, he did. Yeah. In, uh, I think it was sponsored by someone in Philadelphia. Yeah. So they, the so they had a competition. Yeah, the Pavarotti right. competition. Um, I had one or two, one or I knew one or two people that um, had 
uh, done this competition and, and said that, um, well, when you get to a certain level, it's like semifinals or finals or something like that. What Pavarotti does is he basically just invites you to shadow him yeah. throughout his day. That's so awesome. <laughs> so it's like you meet him at breakfast and then, and, and, you know, he'll be walking along and, 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 uh, you know, he'll say, well, we're going to go to the theater. You know, he'll just like impromptu. Like it was, yeah. there is no schedule. Yeah. So, you know, he, and then you go into the theater and he said, you know, he basically just says to the, that was like, it's like an entourage, you know, yeah. there's like seven or eight people, all singer, all young singers, you know, sits them down in the, in some of the seats and just starts ranting yeah. about yeah. things that you need to know about this career, yeah. you know, uh, uh singing you know some of the technical stuff about singing you know i mean and it just goes on that's and on invaluable and on. i mean yeah. that stuff you can't get in any yeah. class and then he's like okay we're gonna go to the cafe yeah. and then they sit down at the cafe and he starts another speech mm-hmm. about something and then you know okay we're gonna go for a walk we're in the park we're walking in the park eight people there you know Aww. and then you go to dinner you know and he starts ranting at dinner about uh, about something about the career and stuff like that i mean he just made it a completely like educational yeah. uh, thing, and most of the singers really loved it. I, I think there were some that were just like, "Oh, come on! Like, yeah. just give me the prize they, and they let me go home." They did or... not know what they were doing. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah but um, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, I I think it was um, a tenor named James Caputo. Shout mm-hmm. out to Jimmy Caputo. Um, who told me a story one time because he was one of these people. And I think he was talking about... uh, No, I know he was talking about Roberto Mm -hmm, Alagna. Shout out to Roberto. Uh (laughs) Um, Because I think at one time, Roberto got into this competition. Uh I know he didn't do a lot of competitions. You know, Mm, he he pretty much just sort of self-started his career. I mean, that was... He's got such an incredible talent yeah, yeah. that he didn't need to. But I, I don't know the exact situation. Maybe he was just sort of hanging out with Pavarotti. Pavarotti invited him to be there or something like that. Right. But um, Jimmy told me this story that uh, <laughs> they were they were at a restaurant somewhere and they were kind of, you know, Pavarotti was sort of uh, uh, explaining something about the business and stuff like that. And he just said to Roberto, he's like, oh, Roberto, why don't you just stand up on the table and start singing O Sole Mio or something like that? Because it was like an Italian joint in, yeah. in, you know, in Philadelphia, you know, so you know it's run by Italians. And he did it. Yeah. And it was just like, Jimmy tells me, Jimmy tells the story like, um, like he was so surprised and enamored at the same time because... Roberto showed no hesitation yeah, yeah. when he did that, you know, and he also just showed like no, no apologies at all. Yeah. Like I'm going to jump on the, up on the table and <laughs> sing some, you know, but anyway, that's just sort of a side story that, oh, that I, I remember awesome. from this Pavarotti competition, but yeah, yeah. being, uh, being so close to these singers, you know, and I mean, you know, here you are, you're, you're not even 25, 26 years old yeah. and you've been, you know, six feet away from Domingo singing Pagliacci yes. and Pavarotti singing Cavarotti. Yeah, Cavar- yeah, Cavar- oh, yeah. And man, that that it is that itself. If you if, even if you didn't go on to have a great yeah. career, that is such a <laughs> gift. Oh man, man, that is such a gift. But you know what? Both times you earned the right to be there. Yeah, I have to say I was working my ass off. That's You're for sure. Your ass I mean, off I mean and... you know, I was kind of obsessed, really, to be honest with you. You know, like for me, it's just like if I'm not singing, I, I feel like something's wrong with me. Like, what mm. is the use of me <laughs> yeah. if I'm not like singing and, you know, trying to to emote in this way? That's how I get out a lot of stuff. But also it just feel like, I mean, that, that of course, that's what I'm supposed to do. You know, I don't know. It's been that way for a long time. Mm. So I was working hard. Yeah, I loved it. You know, when... A, you know, when I was in college, for example, the reason why I went insane was because I was walking around with headphones and a score and like learning 
operas that I had no business uh, even singing, even mm-hmm. up to now. Like, I remember I used to know, like, almost every word of Otello just because I listened to the damn thing so much. Right. And, uh, and uh, you know, had a score and just following it and just enjoying it. Mm-hmm. And my colleagues in, in school, you know, they were like, well, you know, what about your theory? And I need to go to blah, blah, blah. And I said, oh, oh who gives a damn? I said, <laughs> uh, I thought you want to be an opera singer, you know? I mean, why aren't you walking around with a score like me listening to these things, you know, getting the idea? You know, I had, I listened to every tenor possible. Yeah. So if I was like in the mood to listen to Faust, for example, I wouldn't just listen to the old Geda recording. I listened to freaking every recording I could find of Faust. Right. And listen to every version of it, you know, just to see what people are doing. And, you know, I listened to it in Italian and I thought, what, the, <laughs> you know, I mean, just it was crazy, you know. So that's how I was, you know, all the time listening. And I noticed a lot of younger people now, there are a lot of uh, younger students now. And they said, that, oh, my teacher tells me, you know, not to listen too much because then you copy. I said, yeah, if you listen to one singer, maybe you'll copy it. But if you listen to every singer, you will not copy them. You just take the best things you can from them you know you try to absorb that stuff and uh, you learn the styles and the traditions and all that stuff and i think it's crazy when a teacher tells a student you know don't listen too much because you know so this is insane how are you yeah. supposed to learn the history and tradition of the performances you know of the singers you know the styles the way people do it ah he does it a little bit like this ah he you know she does it like that you know i mean that's how you learn your craft you know and besides actually doing it of course you know but you know you can't just be i mean you need something to 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 search after you know what i mean you you need inspiration you know so uh i don't know i I noticed that a lot of young singers will say that you know their teacher said oh don't listen too much and i Mm. think that's totally insane i think that's insane too Yeah, yeah yeah Because also there's an aspect of maintaining the historical aspect yeah. of the performance. Yeah, that's a big you know? part of the arts, I think. You know, right? Yeah. I mean, if you if you don't ever listen to La Boheme, and you someday are offered the role of Rodolfo, yeah. you won't know that there's a high C in the aria. Yeah. Because it's not written. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. That's true. <laughs> you this know? is true. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that's the same with uh, La Donna Mobile. Yeah, yeah. The high B is not written. The cadenza exactly, is yeah. not written. You know. <laughs> right? Can you imagine? And you're like, yeah. Ah, and and said, plunk, and the conductor and the, conductor says, "What are you uh, doing?" <laughs> uh, whiskey Tango Fox, try yeah, it, buddy. Yeah, exactly. Like what? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. I think it's also very important. Yeah. Uh, to listen to many, many singers, yeah. as many as as many as you can. It's better to listen live. Sure. I, I think mean, if you can have, yeah, if you yeah. can get to a live performance and hear live singers, I think that's better because, I mean, you can get records, records, uh, you know, albums are the best way to listen to, uh, especially to opera, I think. Yeah. Um, but the cds they compress the sound yeah, and you know i mean same, yeah. yeah i mean i don't get i can listen to a voice on cd and be like that's a great voice yeah. that that moves me even that moves me but nowhere near what what a live performance does oh, yeah, sure. because you just you get the energy yeah. you know from the room and uh you can't put that on a you can't put that on a CD. What, what's this? Um, there, there's a movie coming out recently that, about uh, Celibidace. I, I don't know if I'm saying his name right. Who's Remember it? this conductor, Celibidace? Oh, um, he. I don't he know. Was, I don't know. Who's he was that? like the first. Uh, he was the first conductor uh, of the of the Berlin Philharmonic after ah. World War II. Oh, okay. I don't, I don't know this. So. Because I guess he was around. Berlin he was like going to school so he was he was very young he okay. was in his 20s but he was like basically the only guy they could find who was not affiliated with the Nazi party I see so he became uh, uh, head of the the Berlin Philharmonic and then went to I'm gonna probably say the wrong orchestra but it's it's in Munich. I think it's the Munich Rundfunk, the radio. No, it's no. not the Rundfunk. It's oh, yeah. the Symphonic, oh, okay. maybe, yeah. or the Munich Philharmonic. Yeah. It's either the Munich Philharmonic or the Munich Symphony yeah. 
or Symphonica, yeah, Minchina yeah. Symphonica. Yeah. Anyway, basically the most important orchestra in Munich at that time. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and he famously didn't make any recordings. He's an unbelievable conductor. Yeah. And the reason he never made any recordings was he says, you can't capture on a recording what I'm doing huh. in, on, in the hall, yeah. you know. And now he's passed away and uh, his family is now releasing material. Of course, it's all live. Yeah. He never went into the studio, yeah, yeah. you know, but I can totally get his, I can totally see his side, you know, during COVID I've been making some, some recordings and I mean, I lose the, I totally lose like the passion of it, you know, when I'm making a recording and and I have to do like a splice, especially when I have to do like a splice, you know, that's just the worst. I know. (laughs) That's the worst. Kills the the mood. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not on stage with another actor. I'm not, I don't have all of the, you know, when I'm just recording an aria, I don't have everything that came before that. I'm not in costume. You know, I'm in like this recording studio with all these microphones and headphones and you're thinking to myself, like, this is going to be on the internet forever <laughs> well you know it's no, funny but how we hear ourselves is also very different from how people hear us because you know i mean i listen to a million recordings obviously as you as you you know and you think wow it's so amazing i'm just imagining what they're thinking of themselves too because i know you know when i hear myself on even on some commercial recordings i've done and i thought eh, and everyone uh, someone else will say oh i love this recording so much it's so beautiful and i think I fooled you, you know, because I was like, <laughs> I was trying to get into it, but it's, yeah, it's not the same, of course, yeah. Yeah, or it doesn't whatever, have that yeah. spark of whatever it is, you know, yeah. So, I mean, I don't know, that's a whole different thing, you know. Speaking it's, of recordings, you know, this uh, this sort of second golden age of um, of opera, you know, where we're talking about with when Pavarotti and Domingo were singing regularly at the Met, and we had uh, Freni around, yeah. and all these amazing, wonderful singers, and there was this sort of boom of recordings that yeah. came out, you know, I mean, I, I think maybe Domingo has the most. Yeah. He recorded. He just seemed times, to record yeah. everything. It yeah. seems to be a recording of him singing everything. Carreras as well. Mm. Um, I heard that these guys did these recordings for free. Oh, that I don't know, to be honest with you. I, I thought it was basically yeah. for them all promotional. Yeah. I mean, of course, they're making sense. the top fees at all the all yeah. the biggest houses in the world, and maybe they maybe they got something on the back end, like yeah. maybe they got. I think a the royalties were different like back then. I think the royalties mm. were different back then, so maybe that's, that's why it was okay. I mean, the recordings I've done, like, there's not. I mean, there are some royalties, but it's like, oh yeah, it's almost nothing. Yeah, know? exactly. So, um, yeah, that could make sense. It could make sense if they did it that way, where the royalties were much better back then. But I know for sure. With the way the recording industry is like in the old days, as we would say, like in the 50s to even up to the 80s, like the top 40 singers were all recording yep. solo things and tons of operas. And, and nowadays it's like maybe 10. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? And you get the mm-hmm. same people all the time. Whereas in the old days, you would, yeah, you would get your Bergonzi on a lot of recordings or mm-hmm. your Corellis, but you had a huge amount of other ones you right. know like it was just the variation was huge back yeah. then you know yeah. um and solo discs and opera full operas and everything um where nowadays it's much more small because the industry doesn't do as well obviously and then with online streaming and everything you know they just don't sell as much right um you know someone download you know for a dollar and you know where back then you know you had to buy the album mm. you know with the pictures and all the the production that goes with it yeah. So it's totally a different uh, beast now, you know. Yeah. So a lot of people are doing their own CDs now, which which I think is great. That one CD, they're all doing their own recordings. Yeah. You got to spend a yeah. lot of money to do that. Yeah. You have, you know, e- either find somebody to distribute it for you and everything. Exactly. But, yeah. yeah. I think what's happening with a lot of singers nowadays is that um, you know they're top singers, but. Uh, 
they're not getting a big contract. So what they do is, you know, they find the money either themselves or someone who supports it. Sure. They make the whole album. You know, you have to get the orchestra, you get the studio, you get a tone meister, you know, a producer who produces the actual sound and the mix and all that stuff. Uh, you get a conductor all that time, those days in the in the studio. And then um, after that's all done, you know, you do your own photos, you know, everything, yourself, let's say yourself, and you have the masters. And then what happens is a lot of times they'll take it to one of the bigger labels and say, well, right. this product is basically done already. Are you interested in it? And would, you know, you put it on on your label and basically none of the costs have gone to that label right. <laughs> except for some promotion. And right. But they get some of the benefit of it. Now, of course, you know, uh, even the best selling classical artists, you know, it seems ridiculous compared to, I don't know, you know, uh, uh, a famous Lady Gaga. But yeah, yeah whatever Lady Gaga <laughs> you know what I mean of course yeah compare Kaufman to yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, Lady you can't, Gaga you can't I mean, compare you it you can't know? even compare yeah it. of yeah. course it's not the same game but um, yeah then that, that's how it is nowadays but in the old days it wasn't like that they were recording like crazy hmm. you know you know from from the most famous singers to ones who were great singers who were singing all over but they weren't household names you know like Pavarotti but hmm. everyone was getting recorded back then yeah not anymore though yeah, which is unfortunate because there are a lot of good singers. You know? Yeah. You know. Yeah, it's very interesting. You know. It's an interesting time when it comes to recording because of the streaming and stuff like that. Um, I wonder, too, if the the sort of uh, the type of opera fan that listens to opera recordings enjoys even listening to a live recording as opposed to a studio recording. Yeah, I guess that's a good question. I mean, some people really do like live recordings because, yeah. you know, at least you get something that's realistic and not so produced. Right. But at the same time, you know, I, I have this uh, part of me that likes to collect things. Uh, they say it's a, it's a man thing, but I think women do it too. But, you know, I, I have a, a lot of recordings of tenors, you know, but most of them are studio recordings, you know, and there's something kind of really nice about it, you know, when you have all the arias, you know, maybe there's a theme, maybe there's not, but, you know, and I put them in alphabetical order and, you know, it's like, you know, the tenors and, and uh, it's just, uh, you know, there's something kind of satisfying about that, you know, it's like, yeah. you know, but it's like putting your baseball cards or comic books in alphabetical order. It's like, I've got this whole, you know, this whole set of people. Um, so that's kind of nice. But for me, the re recording is is more than you know just promotion let's just say um because i always thought it would be amazing to just be part of the of that arc of history you know like okay mm -hmm. here's we're talking about tenors you know we can talk the tenor stuff you know there's a there's a history there's a line yes. there you know that goes you know all the way from caruso and it keeps going and then you know it has uh, ups and downs and there's more at this time and there's less that time and then there's a different type of singer that is more prominent than before and you know there's different there's like a whole story there in mm -hmm. that line of history and uh you know my feeling has been that just i would just want to be in there somewhere you yeah know? i don't you know i don't need to s sell more records than this one or that one or be you know on american express commercials like pavarotti was but if i can be in that line somewhere then you know that that's kind of like a a dream and a goal that i always right. had you know just so it doesn't need to be 50 albums you can do one or two or three whatever just just to be somewhere in there so someone who is a specialist will come back and say oh this is interesting you know yeah um uh, you know that that sounds interesting yeah, to me like you I hear, want that you hear like their influences and things yeah. like that um i mean yeah and you know when we were talking about listening to listening to tenors uh you know not just for the historical but i mean you know think about the time before recordings yeah exactly you know opera opera was around for 200 300 years even before the first recording right they only learned by listening, <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, you know, there's, there's the, uh, there's the Italian, uh, tradition of, uh, you know, these singers, they have a great career, they retire and they become teachers. Yeah. And basically their teaching is the student comes in and he says, okay, sing it like this. Bah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and that was pretty much it. Yeah. 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 That's a whole other thing too with the teaching too and to traditions because you know you know now in this day with YouTube you know you find a, a lot of 
old videos and old recordings of old singers oh, and, yeah. you know and then there's always a debate you know you know like there's some old there's a certain set of uh, fans out there who say well you know basically anyone after 1980 you know any singer after 1980 is complete shit you know oh, <laughs> and yeah. only there are only good singers you know before then and i would say even from the 70s you know a lot of people will think that you know it has to be before the 70s even if you really want the best singers you know and uh you know in this being in this career for a while you know you you have all kinds of levels you know some yeah. people have great careers and you think well i heard another person there that i think is actually better but they don't have the same career but to say that i mean of course that happens in every kind of business and every kind of uh, um you know art or whatever but to say that there are not any great singers nowadays is just totally insane there's a lot of great oh, singers there's a you lot know? of great singers <laughs> you yeah. know what i mean i mean and also, you can't compare. We cannot hear what Caruso sounded like in the theater, you know, of right. course. And a lot of times, it, those old singers who actually I love, like I love them. Mm -hmm. But, you know, once they pass and you can't have access to them anymore except in a recording, they become kind of godlike, with, you know, and infallible, right. you know. Like, you can't say anything bad about Corelli, for example. Right. If you said it publicly, you know, it's like... I don't know. You could be shamed, yeah, you know, exactly. uh, off be the earth. You know, you'll be canceled <laughs> if you say if you criticize Corelli or something. Yeah. You know what I mean? Well, I mean, I, I'm here to do it right now. I mean, sometimes he sings like a total pig. <laughs> I mean, he really does. I mean, it's sloppy as can be. Yeah. Now, is the sound amazing? Yes, it's like a godlike sound. I mean, yeah. sometimes I mean, you just cannot. He's incomparable. But you can't say he's perfect all the time. Yeah. You know, it's like, bleh. I mean, he sounds like he's drunk. Yeah, sometimes yeah. it's so, you know, um, it's just, yeah, sometimes you know, it's a mess. The addiction is, yeah, is It's is a mess, you know. Sometimes, sometimes it's yeah. like, no, I mean, it's just a sloppy mess sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, do I adore him? Yes, I do. I, I love him with his faults too. But to say that he's, you know, un touchable i mean it's kind of ridiculous really you know yeah. what i mean but especially there are some where like people will not allow you to say something bad about them yeah and i think that's totally wrong you know that's crazy <laughs> yeah. it's crazy you know yeah i mean i i think you have to be i mean wow it's really hard to uh to you know accept the fact that uh you know we we make lots of mistakes in this business <laughs> yeah. it's a live art form yeah big time you know it's a live art form so uh uh you know uh arthur our teacher yeah. he uh you know famously tells me these stories all the time because i think he had like i think he had a subscription to the met yeah yeah uh, he heard Corelli many times. He heard the Corelli theater, yeah. many times, Bergonzi many times, mm -hmm. and Pavarotti. He famously tells yeah. me, you know, I think I heard Pavarotti sing um, Duca and Rigoletto. I, he said, I think I heard him sing it ten times. Yeah, and he cracked on the high B eight. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> eight. eight. <laughs> That's only twenty percent <laughs> of, uh, of the high Bs. You know, yeah, but you know, they were look human. At the, yeah, they were human. You know, and I, I think you were you playing the, were you playing us that uh, clip on YouTube of the you know the sort of tenor fails. Oh, yeah, we we were having we were just we were kind having of messing another, around. Yeah, watching YouTube. Yeah, yeah, and and uh, yeah, I mean that that stuff kind of hurts my heart. You yeah, know, yeah. when you hear. <laughs> you I always feel a little bit better though, not because I'm laughing at their uh, misfortune, but I think. Oh, well, they're human, actually. Yeah, they're you know? human, so you feel exactly. like, okay, I guess everything's going to be okay. Right. Actually, in, in, talking about Corelli, too, because I, uh, you know, you can find pretty easily, you know, some cracks and fails of basically any famous tenor that Absolutely. you can think of. Yeah. But Corelli's hard to find. Ah. It's hard to find him um singing something badly uh meaning in the sense where he, you know he's really have you know messing up something yeah, you know it's been scoured yeah, from the internet yeah, by his estate know, yeah but <laughs> but i i i suspect that it's more that as soon as he felt the slightest itch in his throat he would just cancel he oh. was kind of infamous for just canceling at the you know when the wind blew the wrong way or something right, you know? right. i don't know how true that is but that's kind of the story about him you know so maybe that's why there are so few things on you know live that are recorded uh, where he's messing up you know because he just canceled instead right so but finally i found one not so long ago and it's him singing uh, you know celeste aida you know okay and uh, you know you're hearing him i think it's actually from the met actually and uh, he's singing and as soon as you hear it you think oh he sounds a bit 
let's say heavier than he normally does you know it sounds a bit so maybe he has a bit of a cold or something but you know he's singing and you're thinking well he's not having that much of a problem he sounds incredible you know so at the end he gets to the famous part you know um, un trono vicino al sol un trono vicino al sol and he goes up you know and mm-hmm. it's it's epic high b yeah but he's very famous as you know uh for doing the big diminuendo yeah. on the b yeah so he tries his famous diminuendo and it just goes to hell so he's like Vicino al sol. when he starts forte it's incredible yeah ah, and it just turns oh, into like ah. and, I, ah, and at first i went oh my god and then i thought oh thank god finally i found something of him yeah. messing up i'm like okay he's human you know he's not like this crazy you know mythical creature beast right, you know who exactly. just sings incredible every time you know so i was actually i loved him a b- bit more actually after okay. i heard that yeah <laughs> so that's good that's amazing yeah, yeah. <laughs> that is amazing tell me what else so <laughs> yeah what else well what do you think what do you think the future of opera is going to be here well mm. It's tough That's question. a very broad question. Sure, sure. But I mean, I, I guess what I'm talking about specifically is the the sense of maintaining and preserving the historical sense in a historical sense of you know this sort of live performance. Yeah. You know, I think I think there's that you know opera companies have been doing a pretty good job of it um i'm not such a huge fan of the more contemporary operas i think they do have their place i just tend to not be such a huge fan of them Mm -hmm. you know same thing with uh you know sort of these uh productions that are traditional operas that take place in non-traditional we'll say settings uh, i'm already used to it i've done so many so i'm like yeah whatever yeah 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 i mean uh, uh i think i was telling you you know just the other day when i jumped in for this butterfly yeah. it was you know took place in a sushi restaurant you know i mean so uh you know amazing yeah it's like this stuff is out there and i don't think we're gonna stop that yeah. but do we get to a point where there's no traditional opera no. there's no traditional settings it's interesting when you ask me that question the first thing that popped in my head is about the art itself and uh you know some people are saying ah well you know like i was uh, saying before you know oh you know the this old tradition of the way they used to sing is dying out and we have less and less people who can do it and there is uh it it would be wrong to say that there is not some let's say modernizing um of the business and the art itself because for example nowadays um you know looks are more important than they used to be yeah that's the kind of society we have that we've yep. been working to, well not not working towards but it's been going in that direction for sure. a long time anyway so i make the comparison all the time like you know if you look at the 70s and 80s bands you know um they were incredible musicians they all played their own instruments they wrote their own songs Mm -hmm. they sang there was no auto tune nope you know um and their music had incredible melodies and great lyrics and i mean complex you know chords and everything like that and those guys did it all themselves right but when you look at them, you think, well, okay, they weren't always the prettiest people no, you ever saw. You know what I mean? You're they like, really oh, they, weren't. They, they weren't really sex symbols. I mean, you have some, of course, who were, but, you know, most of the time, no. Whereas nowadays, you have the complete opposite. They mm-hmm. all look sexy, you know, yep. with big round asses or, you know, great bodies or mm-hmm. whatever. And But they sing with auto-tune. They don't write yep. their own music. They don't play their own instruments. That's I right. mean, very few of them Very do. few. You know what I mean? I'm talking about the majority. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's complete opposite. Mm-hmm. So I don't like that personally, you know? I yeah. mean, it's nice visually to see someone who looks, you know, attractive. Of course, everyone likes that. So I think opera is also doing some of that. But because of the nature of the of the art itself, it 
you can't fake it that much. You know right. what I mean? It's still about the singing and about the music. So you can't fake it too much. Now, some people say, oh, at a, at a certain point, everyone's going to be miked and, you know, and then you're going to lose this tradition of being able to really, uh, you know, make that sound, you know, and then people will stop using their diaphragm because they'll always have a microphone and then right. you'll lose the tradition of real classical operatic singing. I don't think so because I think enough people... Uh, find that visceral part of it uh, important, you know, and the singers of today, even the young singers, um, they still, what I've seen, they still see that uh, that ideal of singing with no mics and, you know, creating this exciting sound is still the goal, you know what I mean? Yeah. And I think um, there are also, you know, you, you find some people, I'm, um, I'm not thinking even of any specific names, but there are some times you see nowadays in the career where you think, well, that person's very attractive and they have a decently good voice. So they have mm-hmm. a good voice, but it's not like, wow, crazy exceptional, but they look really beautiful and they move well on stage. So you can accept this. Or you find someone who doesn't look so great, but they have an exceptional voice and those still get in also, although it's not as easy as it was before. And I think that's somewhat acceptable. You know what I mean? I don't think that that means it's the end of the art. So I I don't feel that, um, you know, like some people who are maybe more uh, looking at it in a dark way, I don't think it's the end of opera. You know, I think Mm -hmm. there are still enough uh, talented singers who... Uh, you know, who are working towards that, you know, that old classic ideal of really creating that visceral kind of sound on stage, you know, like, listen, I was just at the Met, and it's a big ass place. The acoustic is good. But no matter what you do, you know, it's, it's hard to sing to 4,000 people. Yeah, Yeah. it's a big place. You know, the orchestra is big, you know. Mm -hmm. So I mean, I don't know, I, I, I've, I haven't been told in a long time that I have a small voice. I have a perfectly uh, capable voice. But, you know, there are some places where you think, wow, I wish I was louder there. Because, uh, you know, if, if an orchestra of 100 people want to kill you, they can kill you. Yep. You know, it doesn't matter who you are, you know. But, um, you know, I would rather take some of that than uh, that everything is miked. You know what I mean? So, or I rather sing in Europe in smaller houses where I don't need to worry about that as much. Right. You know what I mean? Right. So, um, but this is a, a process, you know. I mean, yeah, I mean, when I heard Pavarotti at the Met, you know, I almost, I thought, is he miked? Because yeah. he was so so present in the house Mm -hmm. and i just realized that's just his voice but it also took time i heard him in his later years you know um so you know it doesn't you know you also need the the voice to mature and you know i'm much let's say if you want to just be very simple about it i'm much louder now than i was 10 years ago Mm -hmm. but uh it's not because uh, i um am stronger it's just i mean i'm stronger by by development you know, mm-hmm. not that I'm pushing harder, obviously, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? So I think sometimes it just takes time also, you know? And uh, yeah. and so I think that the art itself is is pretty safe as far as the production goes. Uh, you know, there are a big group of people who want it to be reinvented all the time. And then there's a huge amount of people who want to keep it in that classical way. And I think they balance each other out. So yeah. I've done both classical ones and modern productions that people say, what is the use of this? And this is insane. My way of doing it is I always think if the conduct excuse me the director has a vision it's partly my job to help him create his vision so if I was a director I would expect that the singers would help me try to create my vision now it doesn't mean that they have no say you know um you know I mean I mean some things are a bit insane you know I can't sing a high C when you're on your you know doing a handstand but exactly but you know about concepts and everything I'm kind of okay with it uh even when it doesn't make sense I can be abstract maybe that's just my brain you know but um sure I prefer things that dramatically make a lot more sense you know right and not to be too abstract all the time um you know I, I I'm more accepting that way yeah maybe because i'm on stage and i feel like it's a team when you're making a new production you know i I think only one time have i done a production where you know where they've booed the director at the end and i thought well he kind of deserves it you know what i mean (laughs) usually i'm like ah screw them they just don't get it you know or they or they don't understand what we've put into it okay they don't like this and they don't like that whatever but booing come on you know what i mean only one time did i think well 
it was a bit deserved. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> you know, but uh, you know, so uh, you know, I think I think we're safe. I think mm. I, th- I think so. At least that's my my gut yeah. feeling. You know, I'm concerned. I think mostly with the role of the maestros. Yeah. Because I feel like the talent is a bit thin. Mm. The maestros who are really um, at the top of their game, you know, are phenomenal. Yeah. I think we have, you know, we live in this time where now, you know, we have Domingo conducting, we have Baron Boim conducting. Um, but we have a lot of conductors who don't, you talked about the orchestra and their, their, their power. Yeah. We have a lot of conductors who don't know a lot about controlling an orchestra. You know, it, you know, we have a lot of maestros out there who don't have a really strong sense of the drama because, you know, in my opinion, they are just as responsible and, and actually more so than the director in maintaining the drama. Yeah. I mean, think about how many times just a tempo can ruin the mood of oh, a piece, you know, time, yeah, or yeah. destroy a singer on stage, yeah, you know, yeah. if it's too fast or too slow. Yeah. Um, and these orchestras today, you know, it's only been... I might have to look this up. Uh, but I think it's only been 70, 60, 70 years that the string sections have been using steel strings. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Before that, it was cat, guns, yeah, cat, yeah, yeah. cat gut strings. Yeah, sure, yeah. Which are much, much softer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I mean, that's changed a lot, you know. Also I mean, with the tuning. And you know, the, they, they tune up uh, a lot of, not every uh, orchestra, but a lot of places, they'll, they're will they tuned a little higher. To they're be tuned a, higher? Yeah, to be a bit brighter sound. Okay. Like a, like in Vienna, in Vienna, for example, they're like at 4-4-4 four, four, four or something like that. They're really? Like, yeah, they, yeah, they're higher. Yeah, I don't remember the exact number, but it's that. higher than other places. I never heard that before. That's amazing. Yeah, it, it gives them a brighter sound mm-hmm. and it cuts a bit more. But, um, I mean, it sounds ridiculous. Like, what's a dis difference between 440 and 443 or whatever but you know singer feels it you know you feel it right away you feel it sure yeah. and and it's the kind of thing where okay let's put those two orchestras side to side yeah. and then you will hear a difference oh yeah you, for sure. you will hear a brighter sound yeah. so and brighter all it just cuts it's a bit it's loud it's literally louder yeah. to the ear yeah, yeah yeah so yeah yeah so i'm very concerned with the future of opera when it comes to the conductors yeah. because they ultimately are in charge of the performances once they start. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I what, mean... What I've they, noticed, sorry to interrupt him, mm-hmm. but what I've noticed uh, so far in, um, in this career already is that, uh, I mean, there are a lot of great musicians, you know, and people who are just out there trying to do their best, absolutely. But what I do notice, which can happen with any type of artist, but I do notice with some conductors that in in a grand effort to to be individual sometimes they will do things that are just the opposite of the most oh, obvious you know what i mean I just so hate that. you know this aria is goes in this tempo and there's a reason why it goes in that tempo because yep. that's how it goes you know what i mean so you don't need to reinvent the wheel basically you know and sometimes they do that they say no yeah but you know we're gonna you know basically we're not gonna do that thing that karyan did or that you know blah 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 did because that's already been done so we're gonna try something different even if it doesn't really work and the cuts you know what i mean sometimes the cuts (laughs) sometimes the cuts are so strange you know or they you know i've been in productions where they rearrange numbers Oh yeah, really? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it can happen. It's yeah. like, what? What do you mean you're rearranging numbers? Yeah, yeah. How can this scene happen before that scene? Yeah. Or, or there's zero cuts. Yeah, and you know, and then that makes it much harder on the singer a lot of times, and then um, you know, it, it's it's more tiring. But in the old days, you know, like for example, even in Traviata, for example, even not even that long ago, like 
with even in Carrera's time, you know, uh, there's mm-hmm. many recordings of him. He has a famous live recording of Traviata. I don't remember where it's from, maybe Tokyo. There's no Cabaletta. Nope. And he's not the only one who did that. Nope, you're absolutely so right. Many s- singers yeah. at the time, there was no Cabaletta, for example. That mm-hmm. Cabaletta is kind of, you know, famous for being hard as hell. Yeah. You know what I mean? And now, of course, it's like, of course you sing the Cabaletta. Course, How can you yeah. not? And back then they didn't. You know, yeah, so it was but less, only one less verse. Yeah, 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 yeah. One verse. I've done it with two. Also, I've done it too. Where conductors say, "No, no, no, we're doing it with no cuts at all," and you're thinking, well, "Wow, okay." You know what I mean? But okay, fine. You know, you you can do it. You know, um, but you know what I'm saying? You did know, you, did you, uh, you did Duca, yeah. I've done it a couple times. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Did you do the Cabaletta in? Uh... Oh, for the the Parmi, yeah, the yeah. Parmi. Yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah, and. W- one time I did it with one verse, and another time I did it with no cuts. I did it yeah, two times. Yeah, I did it one time with yeah. with with the two verses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's and hard. Boy, it really changes the <laughs> atmosphere of Act Two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. you, I mean, with with both both verses of the Cabaletta, and then you know you have this extended uh, restatif, yeah. and then I mean the aria. Yeah, it's tricky. Yeah. The aria can can destroy you if you're not (laughs) focused and i mean fortunately you have that little men's chorus which you don't have in traviata before before the cabaletta and that you have at least a chance to uh, catch your breath (laughs) and you know if 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 there's a a nice chorus member who'll bring you like a glass of (laughs) you know a a fake goblet of of wine which is actually you know water (laughs) um but yeah but anyway yeah (laughs) so so yeah, so I think I, I, I'm a bit I'm a bit worried about about the maestros yeah. because even with the steel strings of the orchestra, yeah. you know, and I mean, you know, what that what that does, what the repercussions of that is, is that the the singers get destroyed. Yeah, yeah, sure. You know, and the audiences don't enjoy it. Yeah, you know. Yeah, sure. So I mean... the so the maestros, I I put a lot of pressure on them because I, I think the word you know, of course, maestro is. It, it means master. Yeah, yeah. It, it and and it to call someone a maestro should really carry that definition. Yeah, I, the word gets thrown around really, really t- a bit too easily. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I guess it's relative. I mean, I know I sometimes I'll have a, a young singer say, "Oh, maestro," and I always feel uncomfortable. I'm like, "Yeah, yeah." You can I've call me too. pro. <laughs> call me pro, maybe, pro. but not maestro. It sounds a bit weird, you call know. Call me dude. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Call me. Yeah, I mean, maybe pro, you know, but maestro. It's, it's yeah, just sounds I, I weird. That, I had that one time too, yeah. uh, it, like from a cover. Someone yeah. was covering me. I'm like, no, you don't have now. Yeah, that's not me. <laughs> no, no that, that's exactly what I did. I, I didn't think, oh, cool, I feel awesome. No, I really was like, uh, yeah, I don't feel like a maestro. You know, I'm still figuring this stuff out too. You know, I mean, yeah, yeah I got the basics down i'm doing fine but i mean you know i mean maestro it, and when you really think of the word it's right yeah exactly i notice a lot of the not all of them but uh, there are some conductors still that you know or let me just say it's more rare to find a conductor who really knows about the voice for example because that's a that's whole different thing another that's yeah, another aspect you know I mean? of the maestro yeah, you know. he's got to understand yeah how you need to breathe and yeah. and yeah i mean oh my gosh i can't I would say it's the majority. I don't know what exact percentage I could put on this, but I would say maybe it's 75 to 80 percent. I have a maestro who doesn't breathe yeah. with you. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like, especially when it comes to an aria. Like, like think about these arias where you really don't have much time to breathe. Like, <laughs> yeah. like Don Jose. Yeah, yeah. I'm okay. Like, like Don Jose, for example. Um, you know, that's not really technically that hard no, of an the, aria no it's not the hardest aria but you don't get a measure off mm-hmm. once you start you sing straight through yeah it basically just goes straight through yeah yeah i mean you can tass it during the uh, you know before the before you do the run to the b flat you yeah. can tass it yeah, you don't you have to sing bit, with yeah. the you exactly. know it's written that you that you actually sing it while the orchestra is still play, playing yeah. But almost no one does it that way. Yep. The tenors, you, you you wait till the orchestra stops and then yeah. you sing the. Exactly. Um, but um, yeah, you have a maestro that doesn't breathe with you in there. Yeah. Forget yeah. it. Yeah. Then these you, little, you get these caught little, behind. The it, transitions yeah. when you do the 
If you don't have a maestro that breathes, that doesn't breathe with you at that moment, yeah, yep. forget it. The, yeah. the aria is ruined. Yeah, 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 yeah. It happens, uh, unfortunately, a bit too often, but uh, Man. depends it, on who it they is. They got their head stuck in the score, yeah. you know, which I don't, I, I have no problem. Like, yeah. there, there's not many geniuses around that can memorize an entire opera score yeah, these days. But, yeah. I mean, I, I do see it happen once in a while. Yeah. Um, but if you don't, the more important thing is that they are breathing with you, that they are feeling the drama as you are feeling it or as the other singers are feeling it on stage, you know, or at least conveying that mm -hmm. to the orchestra. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, totally. And yeah. I think we have, we've lost that, you know. When you go back and you look at, you know, even, uh, okay, Von Karyon, he was a bit of a showman. Yeah. But he still had that. You can see that he, you know, uh, minus is, is sometimes, I think is some, sometimes his facial expressions are a bit, uh, I don't know. But, you know, he had that, you know. Uh, well, I thought he just was always doing such a slow tempo, you never have a problem to breathe. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought that's what it, it was. was. <laughs> it's not always slow tempo. I'm just kidding. I, I just, I'm just heard kidding. something the other day. I just heard something the other day. I can't remember what it was. Where I was actually, I was listening to it. And I was like, "This is fantastic." Yeah. And the tempo was a bit bright. Yeah. And I only found out later it was Funkari. Oh, yeah. I, I like checked it out. I was like, "Oh, that's Funkarion. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Well, he had his own thing going. But you know, you have some of these other, uh, these other, um, Schulte. Yeah. Have you ever seen him conduct your work to it? Yeah, no, no, I you never. Did, no, yeah, it was okay. just, just a bit before me. Yeah. yeah. Um, there is, he was just amazing. There's some video clips on YouTube you can yeah, see yeah, of him yeah, conducting. Sure. He was phenomenal. Um, Bernstein, mm. my gosh. I mean, yeah. I also don't... a bit of a showman, but. Yeah, for sure. Well, that's part of it, I guess. But yeah. you can. Yeah, yeah. I mean, unfortunately, yeah. it, it's part of it, you know. Um, but uh, there was also um, uh, who was the other? Oh, oh, now I'm gonna I'm blanking on his name. Um, he, he he conducted a lot in Vienna, and he was I think he was born in Argentina. Oh, what the heck was his name? It's going to come to me later. Okay. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I just feel like we have, we've lost a bit of that. You know, mm -hmm. the conductors are so um, focused on the sound of the orchestra. Yeah. You know, and we've sort of lost the drama. They've sort of lost the 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 drama you know keeping things together it's always about sort of keeping things together and yeah well you know. i don't know i mean then then it goes into a whole new kind of um what's the word um, um a debate about yeah. uh you know how long do you rehearse do you you know you if if we if we only had uh you know weeks and weeks of rehearsal we could make this like so perfectly you know great and you know or you know i find you know as soon as you rehearse over three weeks you start to get burnt out you know what i mean right. and then you kind of kill it you know or you get too tired before the premiere you know so there's like a sweet spot in there somewhere but uh yeah it depends on what's the balance between you know the staging and the yeah you know, and all that stuff so the other concern i have about the future is um the casting directors oh yeah <laughs> Well, that's a whole different story, yeah, because, yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, anyway, this career is such a, uh, what I mean, this art, it's so um, individual what a person hears, you know what yeah. I mean? Like, so the, if you're singing and uh, the person in, in seat one says, wow, you're the greatest singer I have ever heard in my life, you know, and then the person in seat two thinks, it's horrible, I don't like your voice at all, and I prefer so-and-so, you know, it's just so relative you know to yeah. the it's subjective like, yeah subjective mm -hmm. uh you know yeah, that's a better word uh you know it's like beauty is in the eye of the beholder basically mm -hmm. you know so um i think it's really part of that but uh i have a feeling uh you know that you get a lot of uh people that you know probably don't have 
as much experience as I would imagine they should have for being someone who casts full shows. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that does happen. Sure, that yeah. does happen. There are some out there who are incredible. They have great ears and they have so much knowledge. But, you know, you know, you got a mix. You definitely have a mix. That's for yeah. sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it it's uh, it oftentimes surprises me as to what the what the what qualifications you need to be a casting director, which is yeah, right. What zero. are the quali- yeah? What are yeah? What are the qualifications? <laughs> Actually, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, and and you know you can lump uh, you can lump general directors together with uh, with part of my concern as well because yeah, yeah. you know you can put these these uh, you know non traditional setting operas up there you know put la boheme on the moon talking to you paris opera (laughs) um (laughs) and uh you know you can have the people boo but that might that still might not stop them no no they get press also yeah no that's part of it too (laughs) yeah that's part of it too you know and and you know you you yeah i mean they just they're they worry me yeah. They worry me, you know, not worry. They concern me. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think that is a, I think that's a really legitimate concern for the future of, yeah. of where this art form is going. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know. It seems like, I don't know, but what I've seen so far, my gut feeling is, you know, everything will be fine. It like, it's like that pendulum, you know, swinging back and forth, you know, yeah. Some, you know, when you think it's gone too far that way, then it kind of comes back and then you think, well, you know, you can be a little bit adventurous and you know, then it comes back again. I don't yeah. know. I don't know. Let's Boy, see can what you, happens. Oh, um, wow. I mean, I don't feel the swing back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe <laughs> I don't not. Really yeah. think, I don't really feel the swing back, but can you imagine if we go through a, a time where I don't know, let's say the Generation Y or the Millennials kind of uh, discover opera somehow, maybe through a movie or there's there's some magical uh, influencer on uh, Instagram who right. turns everybody in turns in everybody into opera fans, and they suddenly start demanding traditional production <laughs> performances of everything. Wouldn't that be? Can something? you imagine? Yeah, would be cool. <laughs> that. That would be really something. Yeah. I would love to see that in my lifetime. <laughs> but uh, and that's not to say I hate the I hate all the modern productions. No, sometimes you know. some of them can be incredible. Yeah, so, yeah. Some are yeah. Some are very, um, very very interesting. Yeah, yeah. You know, it, I love especially when a director will say, you know, okay, it's it's. M- m- Maybe it's not totally traditional, yeah. but it's totally it's not off the wall. Yeah. You know. But he'll say, Oh, I know that in this moment of the opera, uh Rodolfo is always feeling a little bit uh a little bit sad. Right. You know, like the end of Don De Lieta. Right. Um, this is just an example that happened for me one time, you know, because he starts he starts then the quartet. Uh, and the music is very sad yeah. at that moment. And so you sort of, I always thought that you sort of play him sad, yeah. a little bit sad, a little bit uh, sheepish, you know, yeah. like, oh man, what did I do to this relationship? What did I do? Right. I totally blew it. And then I had a director one time say, I want to change the mood of this. Don't change the way you're singing it. But instead of going for that sort of sad thing, I want you to be like, well, forget you then. Go do whatever you want, you know? Okay. Because then he has some place to come back to. Yeah. So at the end of the quartet then, when Mimi and Rodolfo are sort of reunited, at least for the time being, yeah. he, can, he can approach that with you know coming from this like uh, you know it's sort of like makeup sex yeah yeah they you know exactly it it turns into a fight at the end of donde lieta yeah yeah and then and the beginning of the quartet well if you want to go your way go fine just go your way see what i care i'm just gonna go and sit on the bench over here (sighs) yeah can't be this bad yeah 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 we we've we've got to figure out a way to work this out you know and then they slowly get back together yeah in the quartet, you know, well, luckily, I lo- Marcello and uh, they're screaming and throwing, yeah. <laughs> throwing stuff at each other. So exactly. you're like, well, we're not that bad. Right. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Um, I actually like when when directors do that. They take a moment that's so 
traditionally seen as one way. Yeah. And then you see it a different way. Yeah. But that know? makes sense. That makes sense. I sure. Mean, you can just it's totally makes sense. I had another you... director uh, in La Boheme also um, give sort of Alcindoro was like uh, pretty much like a wife beater, mm. you know, or girlfriend beater. Right, right. <laughs> uh, and he was like throwing Musetta around when she was. Well, acting, acting out, yeah, acting out yeah. you know for for marcello in the momu scene when she makes mm-hmm. her entrance right. you know and right before she sings uh uh quantum in vol mm-hmm. he slaps her oh well. and that's what makes everybody be quiet in the in the momu you know because it's, you know suddenly it it like stops and you hear the heart bing yeah exactly bing bing and Right before that moment, smack. And, you know, everybody looks up from their plates and says, you know, what was that? You know? And she puts her hand to her face, mm-hmm. you know, and, and then starts. And it's, In and you're defiance? Like, yeah. No, more yeah. like. It, it's more like. It, it ended up being more like a swan song kind of mm-hmm. thing, you know? Oh, okay. For her, like, like a more almost like pity me. Kind of thing, you yeah, know. Yeah, oh, so many ways. Yeah, so of, many yeah, ways yeah. of interpreting it. And then yeah. what was what, what was it at uh, La Scala a couple of years ago? The end of uh, Carmen. Carmen. Carmen kills. Oh no, that wasn't Jose. La Scala. I don't oh, that think it was, it was. It was somewhere else, but yeah, I think it might have been Firenze actually, or okay. something like that. Yeah, yeah, okay. I heard about that. Yeah, crazy. <laughs> I mean, I didn't see it. I, yeah. I think I only. I, I think I just read about it somewhere. Yeah. But uh, we'd have to check out. I bet it's on YouTube somewhere. But um, yeah. how did that even go down? Yeah, I I'm don't trying know. to imagine. Yeah. I mean, she kills him at the end instead. Yeah. And then what does she sing his lines? Yeah, I don't know. I really don't know. Ma was... Jose, Ma <laughs> Jose, <laughs> je t'adore. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. It's kind of crazy. Yeah, crazy. How are we doing on time, man? Yeah, I, I, yeah. It's time for uh, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm. It's almost three now. Oh, it's I almost mean, three. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah, we've been chatting it up yeah, for two hours. Pretty good <laughs> for your first guest appearance. All right, it's good, man. You'll come back, I hope. Hell yeah, of course, man. man. I mean, we, we were doing tenor talk, but you know, dude, we didn't. Uh, we and we only got to like three of the subjects <laughs> I wanted to talk about. So all right, so, we'll, so then, then let's do part two. Yeah, we'll definitely bring it back. That'll be awesome. Yeah. Um. So hey, everybody, this was my first podcast. Awesome. Sweet, thanks the for the Sigawi podcast. Thanks for having me. How'd you get that name? By uh, <laughs> that's right. We're going to talk about it. So <laughs> Sigawi is an acronym mm-hmm. for. Can I get a word in? Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. So, basically describes, you know, it's a conversational exactly, podcast. Yeah. That's cool. It's never like going to be me, like, sort of just sitting here spewing my own thoughts. Yeah, yeah. I'm always going to have a guest. Yeah. Try to keep that guest as interesting as possible. So, awesome. Okay. Yeah. All right, but man. Well, thanks Sigali for having me as podcast. your first one. That's awesome. Thank you. I mean, thank you. It's a pleasure and honor, man. I mean, I'm, I'm glad it worked out with your schedule and everything, because I know you're going... Now you're going back to uh, Florence, Firenze, yeah. for... Uh, La Mico Fritz, yeah, right? Yeah, La Mico Fritz. Yeah. I've never done it before, so yeah, it's first yeah, time. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's not cool. done very often. No, I think they mostly do it in Italy. You know, it's kind of, you know, it's in the repertoire there, but not, usually not outside of Italy. So Yeah, and it's yeah. got the famous Cherry Duet. Yeah, it's which, great. It's Which, man, beautiful. that is some of the most beautiful music it's ever written. It's gorgeous. It's so beautiful. Actually, at first, I was thinking, oh, this opera, it's nice. It's okay. But the more I'm studying it, I'm like, actually, it's really, really beautiful. It's yeah. really beautiful. Charming, really. Yeah. yeah. I love it. Yeah. It's such a... It's, I think think it's not done so much in the states because the story is yeah. a bit weird yeah it's like an old guy yeah and he's he falls in love with a very young girl i don't know is he supposed to be so old they said he was a wealthy landowner i don't know maybe he, he's definitely older than her he yeah, yeah he's, he's probably a... about your age oh ah, okay so really. <laughs> you know he's probably about your age in real life yeah. but you know uh, he's back, smart. back then when he wrote it you know people only lived till 50 years old yeah, so he was old he, at yeah. 46 <laughs> he's he's smart he's smart you get it yeah 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 he's smart that's all yeah he wants to be taken care of when he's older <laughs> yeah 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 so i mean yeah but it's clearly you know it's yeah. a mascani yeah. and it's got that um very small yeah, quality it's to gorgeous. it, and uh, I enjoy it. Fritz is a, uh, it's a, you know, cherry duet is is very lyrical yeah. duet, you know, and that's the most famous thing from that, I yeah. think. 
But uh, I think the rest of the role is pretty dramatic. Yeah, well, it's kind of on and off. Like, the first act is it's nothing. There's nothing okay. serious there at all, at all. Second act, you have the cherry duet. And then towards the end of the second act, then you start to get a little bit more meat into it, but still lyric. And then in the third act, it's, you know, I wouldn't call it dramatic, but it's definitely more full-throated singing. Definitely. Okay. Basically all the third act, okay. you know. And, you know, the orchestration is plenty. Verismo kind of full in a way lyric it's mostly romantic it's he's never too angry he gets uh you know a bit into into despair but uh it's really well done you know it's okay. really really beautiful cool. really really nice yeah so i'm looking forward to it let's see how it yeah goes. i i know you always get some audio clips or something oh yeah so can't wait something. to hear can't right. wait to hear that it's gonna be great I'll try my so best. good all right brother thank you man. so yeah you're welcome thank you yeah. and um Folks, if you are interested in being a sponsor for my podcast, I'd be up for that. Uh, you can check the show notes. I've got an email, which you can email me directly. Um, yeah, I think it's sigawicast at gmail.com. Uh, you can also donate through PayPal or the Cash App. And uh, you can find all that information in the show notes as well. I'll put some... Uh, info about Charlie. I'll put some uh, photos of him all in the show notes. And uh, it's going up on YouTube and it's going up on all of the uh, major podcast providers. So uh, check it out. And I hope you can come back and check out my show uh, in the future. All right. Ciao, guys. All right. Take it easy, everybody. <laughs>